Hi folks, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to Async API conference. I have this amazing pleasure to um, be the first one that kicks off this conference. It's uh, our third conference, uh, online conference, unfortunately not in person this year again, um, but we're, we're planning to fix it next year. Um, the conference has three days, um, ends up on Saturday. Um, all the details about the conference you can find on conference.asyncapi.com website. Uh, the most important is the setup. So you have a group of community members that will do the on-stage duty like I'm doing now that will introduce presenters. But we also have a, have a group of people that work in off-stage. So they're looking on chats, they're making sure that there's uh, the code of conduct is um, respected and that they gather your questions for the presenters. Um, so that's it's it's pretty simple, nothing complicated. Um, so I hope you're gonna enjoy it, and we can actually just start with the first presentation. And the first presentation is from our own Async, one of the uh, members of TSC at Async API, which is uh, Jonas Lagoni, that I will just now ask to join from the backstage. Ask or false? Now I can. Hello. Level. <laughs> Thanks, uh, Jonas, for coming in. Um, since you're presenting live, because like for others, uh, information is that some of the presentations we have pre-recorded, and some are live uh, presented. Um, so in case of Jonas, it's um, it's a live presentation. So I will not do the usual chit chat because uh, uh, you will be able to see Jonas live throughout the whole uh, presentation. So just Jonas, uh, kick off. I'm going backstage. Uh, and you like the stage is yours, and then like um, I'm gonna see when you're finished. Uh, I'll join <laughs> and I will check if there are some questions from the audience. Sounds good. You ready to go? Yeah, as ready as I can be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me go to backstage. Hello, everyone. So it's my great pleasure to be the very first that's gonna present for this year's Async API conference. Um, I'm going to talk about the future of Async API and more specifically about the version three that we are working on. Now, whether you're watching this live or watching a recording later, I hope you're having a fantastic day so far, regardless of whether it's morning or evening where you are. Now, before jumping into it, I just want to say that I am, I am just the humble messenger here. Um, these changes are provided by the champions of the Async API specification. So this means that we have individual contributors that are pushing these changes forward and spending their time in order to make this ecosystem as best as it possibly can. So just want to say a very big thank you to you. Throughout this presentation, I'm gonna use uh, I'm going to have these types of um, links to the discussions that we have and the issues that I'm talking about. Uh, I'm going to provide it in the bottom left side of the screen, which I can see my name is, um, is uh, hovering over. So let's see how much you can see. But I wanted to give you, I'm going to make these presentation slides uh, public as well after this. But yeah, all of these issues are something that you can access through this link. Throughout this presentation, I'm also going to use an example application that we have defined with Async API to show how these changes are affecting the spec itself and the documents that you create. So in this case, we have a very simple account service, which is in charge of processing user signups. Very simple. And it does this by, um, by interacting over this user signed up channel, where it says that, well, others are publishing to this channel because we are consuming from it or subscribing to it. And these are, or this is the message that we expect to receive. And this user signed up message is just a very, very simple payload, which is a 
op or an object which has two optional properties, just a simple display name and email, just for the purpose of this demonstration. Now it's of course almost impossible for me to do or to introduce all of the changes that it's, or even all of the discussions that we had. So all of these are, are mainly just a highlight of the different improvements that we are trying to make and the different problems that we're trying to solve. The first one I'm gonna introduce is uh, this publish and subscribe confusion, which you probably already saw in this last example, where you kind of define the operation from the opposite perspective of how others interact with your application. So in the case of our account service, this was that others are publishing to this channel with the following message because we are subscribing to it. That's the pop up confusion that we're trying to solve. Then we have some reusability improvements um, in terms of channels. There's kind of two things, channels and schemas, and how those are reused across multiple async API documents. Third, we have request response pattern, which I don't think it's an understatement if I say, it, say that this is the most widely requested feature within async API. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about references and message payload, because we in Async API, we really want to, to enable you to use any schema format in order to uh, specify the message payload. This means it can be JSON schema, but more specifically, we want to also enable you to use non-JSON schema files, uh, such as protobuf, XSD, to describe your payloads. So it all depends on the ecosystem that you're in. And lastly, I'm just going to quickly touch upon the tooling mentality and how we are trying to how we are trying to change the mentality around tooling and minimize how much effect a breaking change in the spec has on tooling. So, so we minimize this ripple effect as much as possible. But let's start off with the publish and subscribe confusion. Now the problem comes from this very simple question that if you're trying to use async API to define what, or if, for example, in this case, how do you define that an application subscribes or consumes from a certain channel? If we take a look at our example async API document, you can see that this publish operation, which is where everything uh, or this whole confusion comes from, is that, well, publish operation defines the messages consumed by the application and not what the application does in its terms of behavior. And this can be very confusing, especially in event-driven architectures where this client perspective, that's not something you have. You have it in REST and you have it in, um, and you have it in uh, WebSockets, for example. But in other broker-based architectures, you don't have that client perspective and it creates a, a bunch of confusion. So the proposed solution for this and the way that we are trying to solve it is that instead of saying this API perspective where we say, where you define how others interact with you or your application, we change this to a behavior type definition that says, well, how do I interact with others? What is my behavior, my application's behavior? So let's take a look at them. And the way that we want to do this is by simply changing the operation keywords in a very simple form. So this means that an application that wants to send certain data to someone or over a specific channel is well, it's instead of subscribing, it's, uh, it's using this send keyword. So you are sending to someone else. Then we have for our case with the account service that is in charge of processing these user sign up. Instead of having this publish operation keyword, we use receive because the account service is receiving over this channel, is receiving this user signed up message.
And yeah, this means for an external application, if you want to define that others, um, that if you want an external application, how others are interacting with your system, you can, for example, say that, well, this external application is in charge of, um, in charge of signing up users and it's sending this user signed up message to the user signed up channel. And that is the very, very basic terms of how it's currently looking like it's going to change. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about reusability improvements. And the very first one we're gonna look at is channels. So in async API, if you have two async API documents, one for each application, one for the account service that is processing the user signup, and then for example, a website backend that allows users to sign up. We then have these two definitions where it's not possible to reuse this channel between the two applications because this operation keyword is kind of in the way because that is different from application to application depending on their behavior. So in order to solve this, we're looking at two possible changes. The first one is that instead of having the channels defined using the address as key in this map, we just have an ID for the channel. And then we introduce this address keyword, which then contains the channel path or uh, the topic, uh, depending on your system, how you wanna interpret it, that, that you can then use these in order to reuse them across multiple documents, which I'm gonna show a little bit later. The second one is that we wanna completely disconnect the operation keywords and which operations an application performs to its very own root object called operations. This means that, for example, for the user signed up or the processing of the user sign up messages, we have this action received, which then just reference the channel that it's operating over called user sign up. And now we have it completely detached from one another. And this means that if you have these two applications again, you can now reference the entire definition of what a channel is across these two documents or those two applications and use the very same definition. And of course, we then have for each of these applications, we of course have two very distinct operations that are just both of them operate over the very same topic or channel. We're also looking at whether we can improve the UX a little bit, whether it is necessary, oh, let me go back, whether it's necessary for applications to define which channels they operate over, or whether we can skip that whole process and just let, let the, the operations reference that external um, document that they both, both of these applications share. The second improvement is schemas and formats. In async API, or we, we wanna solve two problems. The first one is that it's not possible to define schemas of other formats within the component section of the async API document. And the reason this is, is because, well, it's messages that has this schema format keyword that defines what the, what the schema format actually is. This means that once you make this reference, that information is completely lost. So if you have, if you have two messages that both reference the very same payload, it would both have to define this schema format in order for the reference to work correctly. The second one is that 
it's not possible to properly define, and this is the core problem in a sense, that it's not possible to properly define a schema and its format within a self-contained object. So for example, in even if you don't think you're using schema format, this keyword, by default, this is the exact value that any message is using. So unless you overwrite this, this would be the value for it. So for example, let's say that we use Avro. And instead of having this uh, async API schema object to define the message payload, we use something like Avro. Now, just quickly, Avro is a serialization system. So it's, it's you define the message type instead of validation rules that you do with JSON schema. But as you see here, it's not now schemas that's within the component section. It has no information that this user signup payload is described using the schema format keyword or this Avro schema format. So what we are looking at is, well, what if we just move this schema format keyword from the message object and move it down to schemas in order to, whenever you reference something like schemas, it already have the information about, well, what format is it? And we also, of course, then tells it or just inlines the very schema itself. And this enables you to reuse these, let's say that you have two messages, just a simple example where you have two user signed up messages that both reference to the same schema as a payload. Well, now you don't have to duplicate the schema format um, value in any of the cases. And this means that the entire schema object is a self-contained object that everyone can reference without having to also have this duplicate data. Then we have request and response pattern. We are looking at four different use cases. And those are the main ones that we are focusing on. The first one is how do you define a request response pattern where you have a predefined response topic? So at design time, whenever you design the behavior of the application, you can you can predefine to which topic that the response is returned to. Then we also have something like dynamic response topics and a new response topic per reply top, uh, for each reply message or for each request. And these use cases are, um, are for if the underlying protocol, for example, where the response topic is purely dynamical and are something that is not resolved or defined before that you actually send the request. For example, in NATS, by default, everything is dynamically created. So when you cr make a request over a certain topic, that uh, NATS then automatically creates this reply topic for you and subscribes you to that topic. So everything it handles uh, natively within NATS there. But then we're also looking at WebSockets, for example, because WebSockets is a little bit different than most because everything runs over the very same channel. All the messages runs over the root channel and there's no segregation in any form. So there you only have access to something like a correlation ID or reply topic ID. So let's look at a very basic example. For example, a ping and a pong. So I'm sending a ping and I respect and I expect a pong response. The way that this can be described or that uh, we are suggesting is that, well, you then have these two kinds of operations. We have the initiator of the ping, which is that you take the action of sending the ping message over the following ping channel. Then you have, then you define the reply channel 
that you expect a reply to come back to, which is the punk channel. You can then also have the opposite side, of course, which is, well, I am receiving a request and I am expecting to send a response in return. And in these cases, we then just switch the, um, the action to be a receive. So we receive the, um, we receive a message or the ping channel, and then we reply with the punk or over the punk channel. Then we have these dynamic at runtime creation topics. And we're looking at, well, what if we just have these address null um, types where instead of having a well-defined uh, topic that the response gets back to, it's null or undefined in a sense until you reach the runtime. Um, yes, and this is still highly work in progress. Um, we're still discussing this uh, and there's nothing that has been merged within the spec itself yet regarding this, but it is underway. Next up is references and message payloads. And that's how can we, how can we enable you to reference non-JSON formats for the message payload such as XSD schemas or protobuf schemas. And this is, it's a problem because there's no standard that properly defined this behavior. There's no standard that we can say, well, we just use, um, in our case in 2.5, we use JSON schema, a JSON reference standard. But that JSON reference standard is, well, as I read it, mainly about referencing to JSON data. So the way that we're looking at changing this is, is kind of in two ways. The first one is, or the first possible option is that, well, what if we try and solve this problem in a more common manner across specifications such as JSON schema and open API and async API, of course, because we all use the JSON format and we all use this reference keyword. So it would make everything a lot easier, even in tooling, if we all reference the same standard. So this is what the JSON community is, is mainly trying to push forward here. So I highly recommend you to check this out. The second option is that we try to solve it locally only for async API. And of course, there's a couple of ways of doing this, but one way could be, for example, to make an extension to the already existing standard that we use, which is JSON reference, and just enable us to link to non-JSON data. But this is highly work in progress and it's not easy at all, um, but it is something that we're looking at and spending quite a few hours on. Lastly, I want to talk about tooling mentality, or more specifically, how can we how can we minimize the breaking changes impact on tooling? For example, if you're used to open API and, and its tooling system, for example, whenever a new major version comes out or even a minor version, some tools don't even support it. And that's because it, it takes time and effort to maintain a tool that evolve over time, where the underlying standard evolve over time. So we need to we need to try and take a look at how can we minimize the impact of breaking changes. And the way that we're gonna do that is for something that we call an intent API. So in the very, very basic form, it's you have certain intents whenever you in, try to interact with your async API document in tooling. That means, for example, it could be, or let's just take a use case that's not async API, for example. In this case, it's buy five watermelons. Well, what does that entail? Well, that's the intent, but underneath everything, it's, well, I have to go to the fruit shop or some other shop 
I need to grab five watermelons. Then I need to go and pay for them, put it in a bag, exit the shop, go home. That's everything that's happening, but our intent is just to buy five watermelons. So the way that we are kind of looking at it in terms of intents is that we, we mapped all of the interactions with all of the tools that we currently have within the Async API organization. And then we tried to map all of these intents and then split them out into certain API calls. For example, the intent could be get all operations my application performs. And in the very simple terms, it's just saying the async API document dot operations done. Now, internally within the parser, depending on whether it's version two or three, we then, well, in version two, we have to iterate over all the channels and grabbing all of the operations in there. In version three, we, as we saw before, it could, be, for example, be iterating over all of the operation that there is in the root object. And that is the very, very basic terms of what we are trying to accomplish. Of course, we, we cannot really guard ourselves against every breaking change, because let's say that we change the entire or the core type, for example, for descriptions, instead of a string, Let's say that we want to include it as an object that can have multiple languages. For example, we have a description for English, we have a description for Danish, Spanish, Polish, whatever. Polish, sorry. And that core type now changes from a simple string to an object that's kind of impossible for the intent API to guard against. But other than that, the structural changes, how and where information is located, that should be possible to guard. But this is a highly work in progress as well. Um, but yeah, that's the core changes that I wanted to introduce. So we looked at how we can make it easier to reuse certain sections of the async API document. We saw about how we can um, how we can solve this publish and subscribe confusion. Then we are then the change of enabling request response patterns and enabling the use of non-JSON formats such as XSD and protobuf. And in the end, making breaking changes in the spec less impactful for tooling. And in some cases, you don't even have to update the tool. Um, all you have to do is update the dependency to the passing library. And as a final note, feel free to join us. We have our public bi-weekly meeting that only revolves around uh, version three. That's happening each Wednesday uh, at 4 p.m. UTC. Uh, and it's happening this Wednesday next week. And just to emphasize, we are, we are a friendly bunch of people that just loves open source. And we are more than, uh, what's it called? We are more than willing to help you take your first step in the open source world. Other than that, thanks for your attention. And thanks for me being the, what's it called? Thanks for having me as the first presentation. Um, thanks a lot for uh, submitting for CFP and joining us, Jonas. You're welcome. Um, in the meantime, while we wait, if Ace found some questions in one of the chats, I have one question. Mm -hmm. When do you plan to release 3.0? When it's ready. <laughs> <laughs> we, ha we have a few uh, dates in mind. Uh, I think we talked about or kind of aired it a little bit in terms of April next year. I think it's a soft release um, date, but it all depends on how it goes in terms of solving all of these issues. Um, so there's nothing set in stone yet. Okay. At and least not to my knowledge. I, I know not much more than you. So, um, and if it comes to the list that you shared, like all these different um, problems that we want to solve with 3.0, 
what if I want to have my own? Like I see something that could be changed. Like three zero is anyway bringing in breaking changes. So I'd like to push something forward. What do I do? Can I do it? Or it's just a fixed list that you decided on? There's nobody that decides what changes are introduced in version three. It all depends on your contributions and what you want to push forward. What we have is we have a setup called RFCs, which is a basic setup where uh, changes are moving through stages until it's accepted and released in whatever version that might be. And we release, of course, four times a year. So if you have a breaking change that you see or want to see changed or something that you want to fix within the async API specification, it's all about championing that through. And there's nobody that's kind of guarding you. We're all just having a conversation about what's best for the spec. And in the end, it's of course the code owners, meaning you, that has the final say what goes and what doesn't. I mean, it's it's rather just approving what community wants. But yeah, yeah, I mean, yep. somebody has to. Um, exactly. OK, thank you. So like, it's, um, it's half past, so um, we would be heading to the break now. So thank you a lot, uh, Jonas, again, for joining. You're welcome. And for folks that enjoyed Jonas' presentation, there would be actually another one from Jonas um, in two hours. So stay tuned. And now 10 minutes break. And after the break, we will have a presentation called Patterns for Event-Driven APIs from uh, Eric uh, Wilde. Thanks.
Hello, folks, again, after the short break. Um, the next presentation is um, going to be delivered live from um, Eric Wilde uh, that I will just now invite from the backstage. Okay. Can you hear me, Lukas? I can hear you uh, and I can hear you <laughs> well. Um, I think today only people good. only complain on my audio, so you, you should be good. Okay. <laughs> I yeah. hope so. Uh, so yeah, because you present live, so all the time is for you. Um, so I'm not uh, gonna do a like typical chit chat I would do if there would be a recording of the presentation. So the stage is yours. Like in case of uh, Jonas, just please, uh, I will just enable your presentation and um, good luck. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. And I mean, if we have some time at the end, we can maybe just go and do a little bit of back and forth. So. I, ah, now I see my slides. Thank you very much. That actually is perfect. Okay, great. Let's get started. Welcome, everybody, and thanks for joining my presentation today at the Async API conference. And I'm really happy to be here. It's called Patterns for Event Driven APIs. And the way I came up with that topic was to look at how people are using APIs, where they come from, and maybe different ways, and how you can look at events and how you want to use them in your APIs and in your overall API landscape. Before I get started, just a very brief introduction about myself and what I do. So my name is Erik Wilde. I work for Xway. So we are a company producing API management software for mostly large organizations who are interested in managing their API landscapes. One thing that I want to pitch very briefly is when um, Corona happened, I pivoted a little bit to also producing videos because I was doing a lot of conference presentations and presentations with clients. And um, I am keeping that up. So in case you're interested in API content, check out my channel. You'll find me on YouTube. Just search for my name. I publish interviews with people and, and sometimes just about topics that I find interesting. And I do all of this as part of my work in the X-Way Catalyst team. We're a small team. And our goal is to help organizations to use APIs in a better way. And oftentimes, that means to talk to them about what do we even want to do with APIs, right? So not so much to dive into the details of in the good old rest days, right? Which HTTP method are you using? Which maybe is an interesting discussion to have, but oftentimes it's more about what are you even trying to achieve? And is that a good direction to go in? And that's also the motivation for my presentation today. So one of the things you could ask yourself is um, a little bit, and I'm showing you here the, the hype curves that I'm, show, I'm sure you've all seen, right? Have we reached peak event? Events have become something that is being talked about a lot, and that's good. And um, it's something, if you just look at the API space, then you could say it's just another kind of hype curve that's happening, right? So we have SOAP, which maybe was the, in, uh, the initial wave of API popularity. Then REST came along and said, oh, SOAP is not good. You should all use REST. Then for a little while, we had GraphQL came along, and everybody said, oh, GraphQL, it's the new thing. Right? It'll, everything's better in GraphQL. And now we kind of have the same thing, maybe, for events. And I'm really not trying to diss any of these things. I think these are all good contributions to how to design APIs and how to make sure that you get the most out of your APIs and the consumers of APIs have something useful to work with. So I think the more interesting question really is not so much have we reached peak event, but have we reached peak API, right? Is that something that happens at some point where overall the popularity of the API space will, will be reduced? And I think that's definitely not the case. So I think the API community as a whole, as well as those individual, let's say, sub-communities like event space and maybe GraphQL space, right? I mean, we're all participating in a environment that I say is still very robustly growing. And um, you can kind of 
look for any study that you're interested in. I just picked one more or less at random after Googling where's the API market going. And you will always see that the predictions are the API market is growing at a very robust and um, let's say long-term projected pace. And the reasons for that, I think are fairly obvious, right? One is that more and more things are getting digitalized. So we just have more and more things that become available in a digital way. And I think we also see that more and more organizations are understanding that when they use APIs, they can start doing things that they couldn't do before. So they either can be more competitive or they can just at least not be outperformed by the competition. And therefore, in my mind, just looking at the API space, we definitely still have a, a, a good path ahead of us, regardless of maybe what the next hype may look like. But one of the things that I always encounter, and this is a little bit um, a motivation for my presentation today, is there is sometimes this idea of just by using APIs or maybe just by using events, right? Magically, great things will happen. And that's not the case. And I have those two lovely people here that um, I'm, I'm, I'm watching the comments. So anybody who recognizes those people in the movie, this is from, please let me know. <laughs> you may know it, it's a silly movie, but it's two people who are not overly bright, very nice though. And um, that's just the example. Sometimes what I see in organizations that they say, oh, when we use APIs, wonderful things will happen. Right? And that's not necessarily the case. So you have to make sure that you actually use the right APIs. So for example, that you use APIs that actually drive your business goals and not just some random APIs, some very technical APIs. So, so there is, a, I think, a need for us also in the API community to better understand what people really want to do. And one of the things that I really liked that in my recent videos was with uh, Stephen Bungay. So Stephen Bungay is a, um, a management consultant and I loved his way of putting how to make APIs or anything else for that matter more successful. And I'm sure you will never forget this once you hear that. So what he says is you always have to ask the Spice Girls question. And the Spice Girls question is, tell me what you want tell me what you really, really want. And I think this is really important to keep in mind because in the end, the maybe slightly controversial claim you could make is to say nobody really wants APIs. Right? APIs are just a technical thing. Nobody really wants APIs. What people want are to get things done with APIs and APIs help them. But we also have to make sure that we understand what people really want to get done with APIs instead of just shouting at them, you should use REST, you should use GraphQL, you should use events, right? And, and I think this is always a very good thing to keep in mind that APIs are just something to get stuff done. And I think in the event space, there is a similar thing that you can get different things done with events. And this is what I wanna do today is just to talk you through different patterns of how you can use events and to always be mindful that if you're using events, if you're using environments where people say, maybe we should do event driven things, right? Always also take a step back and ask why, like, why would that be a good solution? Maybe why would that be a better solution than the one we have or the one we alternatively consider and just think through, is that really where we want to go? And the reason why this is an important question is that events cover a very, very wide spectrum, right? There are very, let's say simple, and I would say ephemeral events where you could say these events are really not all that important, so to speak. So I spend a lot of time in the internet of things and web of things space, right? And there are things such as sensor readings, right? So for example, if your temperature sensor, then it may emit regular readings, like every minute, something like this. And this is interesting, but it also really is not such a bad thing if you miss those readings, right? So these would be events where you say, well, yeah, if I listen to that sensor and I get the latest reading, that's fine. I know what the room temperature is, but if I miss that reading, eh, 
not such a big deal, right? So, so that would be a not sort of important event. Other events may be different. So for example, there may be events where already you would want to have some historical data. For example, if there is a sensor that measures when heating is going on and off, maybe that's something where you really want to know, even looking back, right? When did the heating system turn on? When did it turn off? So that you can maybe monitor energy consumption or whatever it is that you want to do. And then there are even other events that are extremely critical, right? So for example, if somebody withdraws money from an account, that's a really important event, right? If you forget about that event, um, the whole accounting system won't really work anymore. So, so this big spectrum of events, I think, is important to keep in mind that if we talk about events, that is just something that, OK, it's an event that happens. But these events can have very different relevance for a business. And I think that's important to keep in mind. And what I want to do today is just walk you through those different patterns of things you can build and different approaches that people are taking just to give you a little bit better idea of what are we even doing here? And maybe not so much just about one API, but also what are we doing for the API landscape? What is our approach to using events? And that is something that may be interesting. So let's look at this spectrum of patterns for event APIs. If we start with a very basic idea, then we can start with saying at the very basic level, an event-based API is just an API that reverses the control flow of our typical request-driven APIs. Instead of waiting for a request coming in from a client, that API will emit those events there is a way of how you can listen to those, and then you get notified of the things that happen. That's kind of the very fundamental and basic definition of what an event API looks like. And it's relatively limited because you have to be there listening why those APN API events happen, but it's useful. And there are some protocols, and I'll just give you some examples. Um, that kind of originate from that space. They also do more things, both of the examples that I'm giving you. So here we'll be talking about AMQP. I'm also be talking about XMPP, uh, MQTT, sorry. <laughs> Didn't pick X XMPP. Um, but the main thing that I want to talk about here is that these are kind of event delivery protocols. Right? So AMQP is a protocol that if you as a client implement AMQP, it's a way of how events will be delivered to you. AMQP originates in the financial sector. So it was something where organizations wanted to have a protocol. If you have um, trading data or you have a stock, um, how do you call these uh, stock? Um, quotes coming in at a regular rate, right? These may be um, information that you want to work with. And AMQP um, specifically tried to make that very efficient because as we all know, for financial information, sometimes the efficiency of these um, delivery mechanisms is very important because it's time sensitive information. So you want, don't want to get delayed notifications. And it, it's just one example of a protocol that in that space, and that example came from a specific area, the financial sector. Um, but in the end, it's a protocol that's designed to deliver events to um, consumers. It also has in there this ability of something that um, calls about exchanges. So it actually has more um, complexity in it. But we'll talk about um, that a little bit later. So let's ignore that for now. The second protocol that I want to mention here is uh, MQTT. You could say it's similar to AMQP in some sense. And this basic idea of it's a protocol that was designed to deliver certain messages to from producers to consumers. Like AMQP, it also has an idea in there of kind of message exchanges. Let's also ignore that for now. 
The difference here is just that MQTT comes from a very different background. So it has been designed as a protocol for very low footprint devices. So something like those temperature sensors I was talking about. And the idea here then is that you can deliver events through that protocol as well. But if we look at those two protocols, right? They're just at the level we looked at them for now. They're just protocols that deliver an event from a producer to a consumer. Now, this is a little bit tricky sometimes because when the consumer is not around, you may miss events. And when there are many, many consumers, maybe the producer gets overwhelmed by having to service all these consumers. So a pattern that you see a lot that is used in um, event architectures is to avoid this direct connection from the event producer to the event consumer and instead have some kind of event queue in there. Right? And that event queue then is a piece of software, you can call it a message exchange or a message broker or an event queue. There are many names how you can use that. Um, but at this level, when we still just look at one producer and um, kind of one consumer or a set of consumers connected to that one consumer, it's mostly all about offloading load from the client. And it's also making sure that if that is something that you want to support in that scenario, for example, event queue will store events and will allow clients to catch up reading events, even though they may already have passed in terms of when they actually happen at the producer side, but um, they can still consume them because they are still um, present in the queue, right? So we have a little bit of buffering in here. And, and one thing you see in API, environments and API landscapes is that this is not something that every API producer should do individually. So this is something that you should support by, for example, providing some infrastructure that API developers who are emitting events can then use to emit those events to that queue instead of having consumers directly connecting to them. So if you're looking for this kind of pattern, then it already makes sense in API landscapes and API environments to say, this is a supported thing. So maybe for example, we'll give you something like RabbitMQ. So RabbitMQ, which actually is based on ANQP, would be a piece of software you can put in the middle there, use it as such an event queue and make it easier for the developers of event APIs to make their events easier to read. It could still be something where it's just a one-to-end relationship. So you're saying, I'm just a producer. I want to have any number of producers, uh, consumers. What's an effective way of achieving that? And you could say, well, you can just put in a rabbit and queue in there. And um, if that is something that you want to do, then maybe providing that as um, a supporting building block in your API landscape would be a good idea. So this already kind of gets you a little bit further along those patterns to a stage where your API delivery, your event delivery of your API becomes more reliable. The next thing that you sometime then hear is not just doing this, but kind of going the next step and saying, we have many APIs that emit um, events and we actually make that multiplicity of APIs and events, all available through one shared event broker. And in that scenario, now you kind of decouple the event production from the event consumption quite a bit better or more. Let's not say better, more. And that is something that you see a fair bit, right? So this is also something you can do with, with RabbitMQ or it's something you can do with Kafka. It's something you can do with many other pieces of infrastructure you can put in in there. And in that case, you might have something that a lot of people would say an event driven architecture saying that this becomes an important part of your overall landscape design, right? So you could say, now I'm not just giving this individual piece to developers for the individual APIs. I'm really saying, hey, 
our API landscape uses events as a first-class citizen. It's an important thing for us to manage as part of our API platform. And now what happens is that producers and consumers have an end-to-end -end relationship. And what becomes more important, and that's, I think, the architecturally important part here, is you now have to think about how do I even know which events can happen on that broker, right? Because all the events that can happen on that broker, they are the, the, um, the combined set of all events of all the individual APIs. And that can be quite many. And each of these APIs can emit multiple events. And, and then the question becomes, how do I even find out where to find those things? And then you can go into places like API marketplaces. Maybe you have an event marketplace where you can find out which events are being emitted. That becomes something where you have to think about that like at the organizational level. Another thing you might have is that you also might think about which APIs do I use internally and which do I use externally? So for example, if you would say, I am having an event-based architecture internally because that's what I want to do. Is that still something that you want to support for externally facing APIs? So for APIs that you design for partners or even for the public. And in many cases, you will see that those APIs are using different mechanisms, different protocols. So they may use things such as WebSockets or server sent events. And in that case, you really get into this area of thinking about, do we have guidelines that talk about this and say for internal events, we always use Kafka or RabbitMQ. For external events, we always use WebSockets or something else, right? And then for both of these things, ideally you would have infrastructure in place that makes it easy for developers to develop APIs for that specific target audience. So for example, if you have event-driven APIs that go to partners or the public, you would have some WebSocket infrastructure and there is an, I would say, an emerging, emerging set of products there that will help you to build up a WebSocket infrastructure. And there can be other things. So another thing that you may have heard about as part of your API guidelines could be to say, we support a pattern that at least we sometimes use, which is called CQRS. So CQRS means that you use, you design an API by having different API variants or whatever you would call them for commands and queries. So CQRS stands for Command and Query Responsibility Segregation. It's kind of a little <laughs> complicated thing there, but it again is something that maybe in your API landscape, you would say, this is how we design APIs, right? So for example, for commands, for making things happen in an API, we actually use a REST style API. And for events, for things that happen within the API and get, um, get messaged to consumers, we use RabbitMQ. Kafka or something else, right? And if you do that, then again, that is something that your guidelines should clearly stay and then there should be infrastructure that helps with building that so that you can actually make this picture happen across all of your API landscape. And um, the last level, I would say, of how far you can go with API with event APIs or with events, let's say. This is something that you may also have heard about. It's event sourcing. So event sourcing is this idea that instead of treating events just as these more or less ephemeral things, you build your architecture really that they become the source of truth so that your system is designed in a way that you don't keep state in a database. You really keep state by logging all events. And then your application state is the result of all of these events, right? This is, for example, how traditional banking systems work. There is no database that has your account balance in it, or let's say that's not the source of truth. The source of truth is all the interactions you had with your bank account and whatever the end result of all these interactions is, that's your account balance. 
So event sourcing is this interesting idea of saying, I'm going all in on events. Events are the only thing that really matters for defining how my system actually behaves and how my system state is defined. And I think it's an interesting approach. But the one thing that I would like to point out is that I think this is a good approach for certain subsystems. So for example, if you would build the accounting system of a bank, maybe you're going in that direction and say, we're using event sourcing as, as our system design. But it typically would probably not be a good choice for building the whole bank, right? Because you still have a lot of systems in the bank that are around, I don't know, loyalty program, customer information, mortgages, this and this and that, right? So a lot of other subsystems that make up the bank. So event sourcing, even though it's interesting, I would say is mostly confined to certain subsystems to certain spaces within organizations. So it is a choice that you can make, but it is one that typically would not be the, the approach that you use for your overall API landscape. And this already concludes a little walk through different patterns for um, event-driven APIs. What I wanted to do is just give you this idea that Events can be used in very different ways. So you may be familiar with this idea of Maslow's hammer. I'm saying that, well, if the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And, and I, I really love this picture, but it's, I think it's also an important concept to keep in mind that also in the event space, like in the general API space, there are many different problems you can solve with events and they have wildly different properties. So always think about why am I doing this? How does this translate into the best way how I should do this? Maybe just design a simple single API this way, maybe put a component in between, maybe really have like this uh, event-driven architecture or go all in with event sourcing. But really think through that because in the end, what you're trying to do, the Spice Girls questions, right, is you shouldn't try to just use APIs, you should try to solve problems and the API that you're using and the event pattern that you're using should just be a good fit for the problem you're trying to solve. So don't be too fundamentalistic about that. Try to be aware of what you're doing. Try to take a step back and look at, am I doing the right thing? And then I think you'll be on a good trajectory with your events. And with that, I'm done. Thank you very much. If you would like to look at the slides, I just tweeted the link to the slides in my um, Twitter feed. So you can find it there. It's also here on the slide. Um, the slides are online, so they are web-based. You can just look at them in your browser. If you want to find out more about more what I'm doing, you can find me on Twitter, YouTube, and LinkedIn. And um, that's it for today. Thank you very much. And I think, Lukas, you can come back on stage. Hey. hey, and thanks a lot for the presentation. Um, I'll wait a bit uh, for the offstage um, uh, team to gather the questions. But in the meantime, I have pretty important question because uh, the title <laughs> of your presentation is super important to me, like even driven APIs. Because recently I had a discussion with Fran. We were talking like, because I'm a fan of saying like even driven is also like this new trend. Is, it's also APIs. Um, yes. Uh, of course, in many cases it's internal, but it's still like internally you also have to have interfaces and APIs, etc. And the thing is that, like, uh, in case of Fran, he had also many discussions with people that do just events when they don't think about even driven approach as API. They question like if like term API should be even used in this context. What do you think? Well, in the end, I think, you know, if you just talk about which words should be used, that very often is not the most useful discussion to have. <laughs> but um, I, I would say um, if you look at it, so, and then, I mean, I'm, I'm a technical guy, right? So I'm, I study computer science, so I, I have a very technical kind of starting point. But in my mind, the most important value that we produce with APIs nowadays when I talk to organizations, right, is not so much just technical, but it's just allowing different organizational units to exchange information. Just like a very, very broad concept, right? Like somebody happened, something happened over here and somebody else should learn about this over there so that they can maybe 
do something useful for the organization and for the end user. So in the end, it's about communications. That's my main takeaway for APIs. It's about enabling communications. And I think if you just look at it at this level, it, I would say it clearly is a, um, an API. It's in the same kind of general space. Right? And there even were. I mean, if you look at it, I don't know, uh, you're too young for this. <laughs> but I do remember when, no, actually, it's not the case. I think it's still Mac OS. I think has the Mac kernel in it, right? At the very super low level of the OS, of the operating system. I think it's Mac. And that's a message-driven um, operating system. So even at the operating system level, you have systems that are built with message passing in mind. And, and that just replaces the more traditional way how they were used, um, how they were designed with APIs. So, so yeah, you could say it's not the traditional style of an API, but it's the very same idea of just allowing different components to exchange information. That's my, my take. So I would definitely talk about them as APIs, but yes, they are a little bit different. That's, um, that's true, but I think they do the same thing fundamentally. Thank you so much. I will increase my voice. So Eric, I think you hear me well, but people on, on YouTube don't yes, hear I me do. very well. So I I might damage your ears, sorry for that. But no, yeah. no, 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 no. Yeah. Um, it's 10 past uh, two, at least in, in Poland. So um, it's time for a break. So again, Eric, um, thank you so much for um, um, being here and, and finding time to present to the Async API community. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. And thanks for being, you know, spontaneous and allowing me to present live because I was not able to uh, deliver my video on time. So thanks a lot for that. Thank you. I think it went fine. So uh, that was a good decision. Thanks a lot. Bye. So yeah, folks, um, 10 minutes break.
Hi folks, welcome again after the break. And now it's time for a presentation from Pratik. Um, and it's gonna be about the beginner guide for uh, generator tools. So let me first invite Pratik from the backstage. Um, Pratik, can you confirm, like raise your hand in the backstage that you're ready to get on stage? Okay, perfect. So, um, um, hello Pratik, uh, just for information for others, in case of this presentation, it's a pre-recorded presentation that we will play now, but as you can see, Pratik is here um, um, at the beginning of the talk and also, also after the whole presentation, so um, he'll jump in after the presentation and be there to answer your questions if you have any. So uh, Pratik, before we play your presentation, do you have anything to add? Want to say something? Um, we can't hear you. You probably have to unmute. Can you? Raise your hand if on your side everything is okay, like you're unmuted, uh, but we can't, we still can't hear you. Um, so yeah, anyway, um, uh, no worries about it. Um, you'll be able to join after the presentation. Oh, I think I could hear something. Could I? No, I think uh, not. So, but yeah, anyway, uh, thanks a lot, Pratik, for being here. Uh, just watch the chat, uh, wait for questions, and try to fix your mic uh, before the end of your presentation. Um, and let me start the play. Hello, everyone. I hope you're doing fine. Welcome to Async API Conference 2022. Thank you so much for joining me. My name is Pratik. I am a student, a technical writer, and a computer engineer currently studying in India. I am an open source contributor and a technical writing intern at Async API Initiative. During the past few months, I had the opportunity of working on generator tool documentation as the part of Google Season of Docs program. 2022. While working on the documentation, I got to use Generator and play around with some of its features. Today's conference, I will be walking you through a beginner's guide on some of the Generator tool use cases. After that, I will be also giving you a demo on how to generate documentation with Async API Generator itself. Before we move forward, here are the things that we are going to cover in today's talk. What is Generator? In this section, I will be covering what Generator is and what it can be used for. When we talk about Generator, there are two components which are very essential to the Generator library. In this following section, we will be discussing what these two components are and what is their purpose in the Generator library. After that, we will be discussing why we need generator in our application or projects. After that, I will be listing down some of the use cases of the generator tool. And finally, I will be giving a demo on how to use generator firsthand to generate documentation for our application. What is generator? Generator is a tool that we can use to generate whatever we want based on the async API file as an input. We can use it to generate things such as code, documentation, diagrams, microservices, and various other applications. As long as you can define it in your async API file, there is no limit to what generator can generate. To specify what exactly must be generated, we need to create a template. A template is just a set of files where you describe what should be the result of the generation process depending on the contents of the async API file we had provided. 
So we just encountered two new terms here. The first is async API file and the second is template. What is async API file first? Async API specification file is a YAML or JSON file which we provide to the generator as an input. This file can be both in the form of YAML or JSON but in most cases it is in YAML form only. Generator then fetches the contents of this async API file using a library called as Arburst. Then generator produces the output primarily based on the contents of that async API specification file. The following image shows how a sample async API specification file looks like. This async API, this async API specification file is a dummy file we can use in your projects. You can find it on async API's GitHub repositories. In the following demo, we are going to use this same file to generate documentation. Template is a project that specifies what exactly you get as an output using generator and the async API file as an input. As opposed to as opposed to async API file, generator knows what to generate because you supplement it with a generator template. Async, async API has a list of readily available templates that you can use in your application. Some of these templates include Markdown template, HTML template, uh, PHP templates, Python templates, and much more. You can find all of them in Async API's official GitHub profile. Why should we use generator? While working on the GitHub generator, I realized that generator is very quick to set up and easy to use on a regular basis. Generator is perfect for effortless of complex documents. As we discussed earlier, there are number of community maintained async API templates that you can use directly in your projects. Generator helps in generation of interactive and understandable API documentation. Generator has a built-in command line interface support. There are some use cases of generator. Generator obviously can be used for basic code generation. It can be used to generate documentation in the form of both HTML as well as Markdown. Generator supports both of these formats for document generation. Generator can be used to produce microservice applications. There are multiple templates available which help generator in producing Java or Python application. Along with that, there are many use cases you can find in the generator tool. Before you actually install the generator tool, there are some requirements we need to meet. Generator in itself is a Node.js application. Therefore, you need to have a Node.js version 12.16 or higher in order to use the latest features of generator. You need to have an NPL version 6.30 or higher. After the requirements are satisfied, you can install the generator library globally to use its CLI. The following npm command will install the generator library globally on your local machine. If you already have the generator installed on your local machine, executing this command will update the generator on your local machine to its latest version. Demo. Here I will be giving you demo on how to generate markdown documentation using async API generator and a template. So as we had discussed, we are going to generate documentation for both HTML as well as Markdown with the help of generator templates and async API specification form. In the screen, you can see the sample async API specification file that we had discussed about in the previous slides. We are going to input this async API specification file to the uh, generator also have an HTML template. This template is developed and managed by async API and you can use this directly into your projects. You can just copy or download this folder on your local machine. Here 
I have loaded this HTML template in my VS code on my local machine. So the first thing we have to do is download the generator library. If you do not have generator library installed, it will obviously install the library globally on your machine. And if you have the generator library already installed, it will update the existing version to the latest. Here it is downloading some libraries. See, the generator library is installed in our system. So in the next step, I am going to produce the output documentation. So the first argument is EG, which stands for async API generator. The second argument is supposed to be the async API file that we are going to feed as an input to the generator. So I am just going to copy down this link. The next argument is the template that, that you are going to be using. So here I am using uh, HTML template. And the next argument is the output flag along with the folder in which you want your output to be. So the generation process has begun. So we can see the output is generated in the folder HTML node templates. Let's take a look at it. As you can see, the documentation for the HTML template has been migrated. The output is fully based on the contents in the AC KPI specification file. Everything along with title, code contents and code blocks are all fetched from AC KPI specification file and displayed as an output. We will be doing the same for markdown template as well. Just like the HTML template, AC KPI specification file. For the templates, we will, we will be using uh, a temp markdown template provided by AC KPI. Just copy the code for download the zip again. So here also I have loaded uh, the markdown template on my local VS code. The step is same. First, we give the G which stands for AC KPI generator. Second, we give the AC KPI YAML file as an input to the generator. The third argument is the AC KPI template of choice. Here it's markdown template. And the final argument is the output flag along with the folder. So as we can see, the markdown file is generated with the same contents, but this time instead of HTML, this file, this file is in the form of markdown file. Everything down from title to uh, table and all of its contents are exactly same as HTML, but the format is different. The content again is fetched from the dummy async API file. As you can see here, this template has a section for hooks, which we talked about. This section contains pieces of code, which help us enhance our generation process. Here, we have been given some supported parameters that we can use with our async API generator library. Just sidebar organization, base ref, version, 
single file, out file list, PDF, config, etc. This supported parameters helps our generator achieve many things. For example, setting this PDF flag will also download a PDF version of whatever our output was. For example, the documentation which was generated. Along with the HTML version or the markdown version, a PDF version will also be generated on our local system in the same folder. And in, inside the readme of every template, there are development hints given. Along with every template, there are uh, details given in the readme file, such as uses, supported parameters, development hints, and contributors. A little markdown. Here we have various supported parameters such as front matter, file name, EOC, version. This out file name, for example, uh, gives the file name of the output file. EOC, for example, if we set it to true, it will include a table of contents in the output markdown. Here also we have various sections such as user supported parameters, development, and contributors. Generator CLI. So, a basic command to generate output has three main components. First is the AG. AG stands for Async API Generator. The second component is the Async API specification file, which we are providing as an input to the generator. The third is the HTML template we are using. Here, you can use any template you want. And the final, uh, and the final component is the output flag and the folder name in which the output will be saved. Uh, thank you so much for joining me in this talk. You can follow me on Twitter at Pratik Haldankar. You can follow me on LinkedIn as well at the same address. Thank you so much for having me. Um, welcome after the, the presentation. Um, Pratik, can you like in the backstage, can you wave, like show your video and let me know if, if you're ready to join, if you manage to fix your um, audio issues? I don't want to spin on the, on the mic. So Pratik, any news from your side? In the meantime, uh, folks, please ask your questions um, in a live chat on YouTube or different locations or just join our Slack, um, Async API Slack, and we have dedicated conference 2022 channel. So let's still give Pratik a moment. In the meantime, I just wanted to share like that I'm super amazed by the presentation, like Pratik joined our community a few months ago and contributes through a Google season of docs. And um, I can definitely see that he learned everything possible about the generator. So we have an expert in, if it comes uh, to Async API generator. Um, tomorrow you're gonna also see a presentation from, from Florence that also with Pratik contributes to the documentation of the Async API generator. So yeah, um, that was awesome. And I see Pratik writes something to me. Okay, I think that he has some issues that we are not going to be able to solve. Um, so yeah, um, unfortunately, but at least uh, he could show up for a sec um, uh, at the beginning of the um, presentation. And remember folks, like we, um, we're here, especially Pratik, he's a regular contributor now. So um, you can find us uh, in our Slack, on our socials and just follow up with your questions like if you have some uh, you don't have to ask your question now you can ask your question in like 20 minutes or tomorrow or or in a week uh, that's completely fine and um if you can't reach pratik then let me know and i'll be um, i'll make sure to to reach pratik to answer your question so far so good so um so sorry uh, sorry pratik um, but yeah, I can see in the chat that uh, Pratik wrote to me that, yeah, he can um, resolve any questions in the chat. Um, so feel free to ask them there. 
So after this amazing uh, introduction to Async API Generator, I uh, invite you to a break, um, a bit longer break. Um, and we are back in, uh, let me check the clock, in 20 minutes. Like, yeah, so we are back in 20 minutes and it's going to be a presentation from Tuli and it's going to be about breaking into open source as a mother in tech, which I'm looking forward to. Um, so yeah, enjoy, uh, enjoy your short break.
Hey folks, uh, welcome after the break. And um, yeah, I have a pleasure to invite a new speaker um, from the backstage. Um, so Tuli, can you uh, wave that you're ready so I can let you in? Can you show that you can listen, like, can you show that you can hear me? Oh yeah, perfect. Uh, awesome. So let me let me <laughs> let me let you in. Um, okay. Uh, welcome to Lee. We're live. Um, before we play your presentation, um, yeah, we we invited you so others can see that you're here. You're um, here also to answer questions later. Do you want to say something before we actually um, play the presentation? Do you want to introduce some somehow some the, the presentation? Yeah, um, so I, I just asked you, like, if before we play your presentation, do you want to, like, say something, like, say just hi or uh, introduce somehow your presentation? No, no worries. Let's play the presentation. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Um, so yeah, anyway, folks, remember, uh, Tuli is here with us. Um, so whenever you have some questions to Tuli, uh, write them in the chat. Um, Tuli will join us after the presentation um, so we can answer some questions. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Async API Day Number Async API Conference Day Number One. Thank you so much for joining me, and I hope you are having a fun field day. My name is Tuli. I'm a technical writer. I'm a data scientist, and I'm a developer slash open source advocate. I love advocating for women in tech, mothers in tech, and people from the underrepresented group. In today's talk. I'll be presenting to you my journey of how I broke into open source as a marketing tech. I will highlight, I'll be highlighting some of the challenges that I faced when I was transitioning from a non-technical background to the tech background. I'll also be highlighting how I finally got my big break after the struggles, after facing the struggles and stigmas. And finally, I'll be also sharing how us as the open source community can do better in supporting the people from underrepresented groups, women and mothers in tech. So uh, I'll be sharing how I grew from a non-technical background uh, into tech. So in the beginning of 2020, when COVID-19 hit, the world that we knew came into shambles. Like most people are there, I lost my job and found myself at home, stranded. I didn't know where to start, where to go, where to begin. And I decided to take a retrospect in my life and see, just in case the world goes back to normal, because we, I still had hope that maybe later in 2020, the economy will get back to normal. COVID was just a passing thing. So I decided to take a retrospect and see if the economy were to get back to normal, maybe tomorrow, would I still want to pursue the current career that I was in? Would I still want to go back to the same work that I was doing? And I came to a conclusion that this was something that I, was, I wasn't passionate about, just something that I didn't love, but for the sake that I was able to put food on the table, I had to do it. So. I decided to take the period of lockdown and decided to upskill and pursue a different career of which I decided to go back to my first lab, which was tech. Although back then when I was still in high school, the society didn't allow women to pursue careers such as, as careers in tech, careers in engineering. Those things were reserved for the male counterparts. Women were supposed to have passion for things such as teaching and nursing, of which was something that I was not 
working or I saw myself doing. So this is why I ended up in the hospitality industry. But then I still decided to say, okay, now that I've grown up, now that I'm in lockdown and it's been years since I last ventured or thought about tech, maybe the society has improved. So let me go and research and find how can I pursue my career in tech without going to school, without having a formal education, without having a computer science degree. And thank God for sites such as Frequent Perm, Coursera, Udacity that provide tech-related courses for free. I hopped in and started my journey in soft learning, improving and more about the stacks tech. So fast forward in 2020, late 2020, I had finally upskilled and gained as knowledge in Python and in data science. And I built some projects, some beginner friendly projects. And I decided, okay, now that I've gotten the fundamental, now I've gotten the required knowledge to gain myself and internship. Now it's time to really look for the industry knowledge of which it was something that I was lacking. So in my decision to look for an internship, I started sending out resumes to different companies, to different programs, and the responses that I usually got, some were not so good, it was a bitter pill to swallow. Most of the times, if I go into an interview, introduce myself and tell them about my background, then tell them that I'm a mother, the first response was like, oh, your skills are great. Your background is great. I love how you have gone so far, but we have one objection. You're a mother. We don't have time to fully commit into the program of which I felt like that was a slap in the face that's a bit of pill to swallow because in as much as I'm in my room I took the time to the initiative despite my responsibilities to self learn to grow my skill I thought that would have come for something because it showed that I'm really dedicated I'm really committed I'm really willing to go an extra mile to get the skill, but not a lot of people, not a lot of organization were willing to give a mother like myself the opportunity to gain that industry knowledge that I was eagerly and willing to gain. Secondly, some of the stereotypes, some of the stigma that I faced when I was looking for an internship was that I don't have the right qualifications or the skills. On top of being told that I was not ready to fully commit, I was told that there were a lot of candidates that were better suited than me that had gone, that had gained like a four-year degree. So what made me so special from someone who has less than a year self-learning? So those were the type of things that really broke me, honestly. They really sent me back. They really... Made me feel less of myself because I thought, okay, the world has changed. It's not the same as back then. So why is everyone shutting their doors on my face? They're not willing to give me an opportunity to grow and learn. And they're telling me that I'm a mother. I don't have, I don't have time to fully commit. And yet I've, I've dedicated myself in upskilling up and making a career in tech on, on my own without having to go in formal education, I thought that it was something that I could count on. Count on. And I remember like, um, with the my milk categories that I started my journey with, they had gone forward. They had gained internship immediately after six months of planning. And for me, it took me a year to finally land an internship for myself. And if we look at the statistics, like even in 2022, you can see that only 26.7% women are currently holding tech-related jobs, of which when we look 
at how the community, the communities and the society is poised to work against women and mothers alike. So back to what I was saying that the more counterparts that I had started with on my many, uh, on my journey, I'm transitioning into tech. They had gone far ahead of me. They had gotten internships in a space of four to six months. And yet me as a mother, I was struggling to just learn one internship, an interview, an opportunity, but I never stopped looking at the doors. And also if we look at the statistics, 50% women report that they face discrimination during hiring processes. Hopefully I can attest to that because no one was willing to give me an opportunity. No one was stay willing to take the risk because they said I'm a risk. I'm a mother, I'm a risk because they didn't know if I would be fully dedicated, fully committed. But my male counterparts, they were not risk. They were the one that they preferred of which I felt like these biases were not meant to accommodate women and they were not meant to accommodate mothers. So thank God someone took a risk and they hired me for the for a six month internship early 2021. I finally got an internship in a data science startup and I learned my data science skills and I learned how to perform, how to create sentiment analysis models, how to work NLP sector. And after the internship had ended, I got a great recommendation. I got to great reviews from my mentor and I, from the internship and my employer. So now I decided, okay, it's now mid 2021, let me look for a job. So during that time when I was looking for a full-time job, things did not work out the way that I thought because still the same biases that I faced when I was looking for an internship a year ago were still following me. I don't have the right qualifications. I don't have the right skills. I'm still lacking. And on top of that, I didn't have the financial input to buy myself a laptop. So no one was really willing like to give or to open their doors to say, okay, totally, we have come this far, come, we will train you, we will help you. Even though when I found a job, finally, I was underpaid, I was working long hours. Unlike my male counterparts, they were getting paid on time. I was not getting paid on time. I remember. Um, in the beginning of the year, my previous employer like held two months of for my pay because I don't know why he did not feel like he did not feel like I have a priority to get paid in time. But if I had to ask my colleagues, they was getting paid in time, of which I felt like this bias is it was becoming too much. I was becoming too overwhelmed with the situation, and I felt like no, maybe take is not really for me anymore. Because the odds from the beginning, the odds were against me. And even now when I'm trying so hard to gain the experience, to gain the industry knowledge, to make something out of myself, nobody's willing to give me a, to give me the opportunity. When someone gives you an opportunity, they are taking advantage of me. They are not paying me. They are underpaying me. And yet I had to work long hours. I had to go an extra mile. So no one really like, so the potential, so the skills that, that no one was willing to see beyond that, okay, in this much as I'm a mother, I'm a woman, I can do better than the next person, than my male counterpart. So no one was willing to take that risk. So as I was in the age of giving, so one day I was scrolling on Twitter. I was just depressed. I, I was just depressed. I felt like giving up, throwing in the towel. And I came, I didn't know that Google Season of Dogs had opened up. And I saw I think API and Alejandro were looking for intense for the Google Season of Dogs program. And I decided, then I decided, okay, 
because they will also be like they will look looking to support women in prep and people from the underrepresented group. Then I said, okay, let me apply and see if maybe they are willing to give me an opportunity because I was really at the stage of throwing in the towel when I came across the treat and honestly, I did not have anything to lose. This was like, how can I say it was the last kick I was dying on. So it was the last kick. It was the last knock on the door. If it didn't work out, I was just going to say, I'll bye bye tag. This is what the decision that I had come up with. So when I went. Uh, when Alejandro sent me an interview mail and said, okay, you're going to come and have an interview with us in API. We want to hear about your background. And uh, fortunately for me, during the period that I was, um, while I was learning, I documented, I wrote blogs, I documented my journey. I used to write beginner friends in the app blogs because I'm an introvert. So the best way for me to communicate is to write. So it worked in my advantage actually. So when I went into interview, I gave my all. I gave 120 or 150 percent because for me, it was the last straw. So I felt like whether I get through to the internship or not, whether I get to the program or not, at least let me give my all. And even if I throw in the towel, I will say I applied everything. It did not work out, but I gave my best. So when I went to the interview, I gave my all. I prepared, I researched about Async API. I didn't even know Async API or anything related to event driven architecture, or did I have any experience in tech, technical documentation, but I just went there. We then gave my all and thank God the risk finally paid off. Um, my all finally paid off. I got selected out of 200 plus applicants. I was selected as one of the six interns that were inducted in the Google Season of Dogs uh, program. So this was where my big break came in. When I was in the verge of giving up, um, finally somebody, the community decided to take a risk and say, no, we love how you journeyed so far. Come, we will train you, we will lead to you and we will give you the support that you need. And indeed it was something that they kept their word. Actually, I think if your community had kept their word. My mentors are so awesome. I just want to give a shout out to Alejandro, to Lucas, and everybody that has supported me so far because they've given me the love, the warmth, and they've helped me to grow my skills, my technical skills, my collaboration skills, my documentation skills. And I have improved so much that they even took the risk to say, it doesn't matter if you don't have the right qualifications. We are willing to help you, of which is not a lot of people out there that will say that. So I loved how the community has welcomed me. They've mentored me. And even now I'm in a position to actually hold the next person hand and say, I can now, I'm in a position to mentor the next person because they have taken the risk. They have Google, they have given me the support, the love and the embracement that I needed, that I lacked, and in despite of everything, they've given me so much support that I cannot even begin to describe. So also while working at Async API, I got the opportunity to learn and know more about event driven architecture, how to document, how to attain technical feedback and how to apply technical feedback to my dogs, how I learned, I've learned how to collaborate. I've learned how to communicate, to over communicate. I've learned how to research better. I've learned how to structure my documentation. 
And I even learned how to create engineering diagrams using MMDR. Or maybe it was something that I didn't even know. So at the end of the day, the community has been so supportive. Like the skills, the knowledge that I had gained in this uh, Google, of, this Google Season of Dogs internship program has been so wonderful. Even me as a technical writer, as a technical documenting writer, I've gained so much knowledge. I've gained so much experience that I never even thought I would gain. And also I would love you to tune into Alejandra's um, talk on adding API instead of doc. And you can hear the wonderful work that we have been doing behind the scenes as the adding API doc. So I would encourage you, to, you guys to stay tuned and listen to the talk and hear the wonderful work that we've been doing. So. In the final section of my talk, I want to highlight how us as open source individuals, as open source community can do better in supporting women, mothers, and people for underrepresented groups. So far, the communities are doing well, but in despite of uh, that, they still a long way to go. There's still a long road to go. Um, I believe like we need to create more mentoring programs in each and every open source community. They shouldn't be limited to programs such as GSOC and Outreach. We need to create like more programs that accommodate people who are looking for experience, people who are looking to gain skills, people who are looking to um, gain knowledge even though despite whether they have a degree or not whether they come from the other representative community or not whether they have the five years three years experience or not whether it's paid or not but we need to have like those such programs that we can say okay come into our open source communities come and contribute we are willing to mentor you we are willing to guide you we're willing to provide the resources and the knowledge for you to gain the skills so that you can go back and maybe in the working class in the free job and be competent. And also, in addition to that, we need also to create awareness initiatives that gravitate towards the elimination of biases during hiring processes. As I highlighted earlier on, 50% of women who are applying for jobs they face discrimination during the hiring processes, of which is something that shouldn't be, that women shouldn't be facing in this modern day and age. We are living in the 21st century. We are living in the fourth industrial revolution. Women shouldn't be, uh, be women shouldn't be faced in facing stigma, facing biases when hiring. Hiring should be fair. Hiring should be equal. In this point, whether I'm a woman, I'm a man, or I come from this group, I come from this background, or I have this sort of degree, only skills should matter. Only the skills that you possess should be something that qualifies you to get a job, not because of your gender, not because of your background. So I believe that open source communities can create awarenesses, can create initiatives to support women to support people from other related groups to help them um and to create awarenesses and say in this part of okay you are facing biases maybe support these women because some of the people decide to say okay i quit tech because i've been told i'm not good enough i can never be good enough to be a working class so i believe that us as open source communities we can embrace we can stand together and say this people shouldn't be doing that industry shouldn't be doing that and say that women are not good enough you know women are not meant to be thought like they're not good enough to get a job because they are not because of their gender or because of their background so these are some of the things that i feel like as myself like we as open source communities can do better at can focus more better at and 
Thank you so much to I think API for the work that they are currently doing, mentoring people like me who didn't have who when the all the doors were shut, they decided to give me an opportunity. Who were saying we are willing to mentor you, we are willing to support you, we are willing to give you the resources and even today, I, I, as I'm speaking to you, I'm now in a capacity to hold the next person hand and say, come join us in KPI, come and contribute to open source. We will help you, we will wait to you. These are the type of things that we should be doing as open source community, even though we are doing it now, but I believe that we can do much more and we can accommodate much more and we can create awareness, we can create so many programs that in and initiative that can drive towards that direction in helping women in helping mothers in helping people from underrepresented groups and in that i conclude uh my talk for today and if you have any questions suggestions and anything that can help um mothers women in tech uh, or if you are an open source community that is willing to go above and beyond or if you have anything to contribute you can reach out to me on twitter on github or you can check me out on linkedin and with that i would like to say thank you so much for listening to my talk and i hope i have provided great insights and maybe you have learned a thing or two if you didn't know what other people are facing out there and also if you have any questions that you might have that i maybe i didn't clarify or you need something to be clarified or maybe if you just have something to say uh you can reach out to me thank you so much for attending today's talk and i hope to see you in the next talk Thank you so much and I'm left speechless. Um, um, Tuli, can you raise your hand? Let me know if I can let you in from the backstage. Okay, perfect. Um, hey, how about now with the audio? Can you hear me well? Yes, I can hear you well. Can you hear me well as well? Yeah, yeah. Can, but can you, um, at least for me, can you try to speak a little bit louder? Um, not sure if others can hear you well. I, I can hear you, but very quiet. Um, so anyway, before we uh, wait for the questions from the audience, I think you already could see in the in the chat that people enjoyed your talk. Um, I, um, I loved it a lot. Um, and I, I'm happy that we could give you a stage for, for your presentation and for others that are just confused, like, isn't it Async API conference? Shouldn't we just talk about spec and tools? Uh, so just for those that uh, joined Async API uh, conference for the first time, um, remember that, that, that Async API, we just not work on the on tech. We actually um, work with people, so we want to uh, fix many different things in open source as much as we can. Um, so that's why we also have our contributors uh, speaking about their experience. Um, Tuli, do you want to add something? Um, maybe summarize your talk, something, say something special. <laughs> well, I didn't prepare for this one, this part yet, but yeah, pretty much I believe like we still have a lot of work to do. Yes, we are trying, we are putting in the work, but we still have a long way to go, like to support women, to support mothers, to support people from underrepresented groups, and like to create more awareness. Like you said, most people might come and say, oh, we are here for the Async API spectrum, but we also need to hear the stories to say, okay, behind that, what are people facing? How can open source communities do better and support everybody else? So. Yeah, that's what I can say. And I totally like power up your your message. Um, one organization or few others will not fix uh, the world. It has to be a group effort. Um, 
Okay, I'll just check again if there are some questions. I don't see any questions in the, in the Slack and also nothing in YouTube. Um, so again, um, Tuli, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to listen to your talk. Uh, thanks a lot for joining live. And for others you don't know yet, uh, so Tuli um, is so close with our community that actually Tuli will also be on stage tomorrow. If, um, if there will be no technical issues, Tuli will run the uh, first part of the second day of the conference. Um, so yeah, see you tomorrow then. See you tomorrow, guys. Thank you so much. Okay, perfect. So um, for you folks, uh, remember, um, yeah, we have breaks. It's online conference. So we have another break now, 10 minutes break. Next presentation will be from Jonas uh, that you could already hear. Uh, at the beginning of the conference. I'm not going to say what is the title of the presentation because Jonas chose a very difficult word in the title and I'm just unable to pronounce it. So you just have to go to conference.asyncapi.com uh, slash schedule and check it out on your own. Sorry, folks. And see you in 10 minutes.
Hey folks, after the break, a bit quicker. I bet Jonas in the backstage is now confused, like, oh, it's two minutes more. Uh, but uh, yeah, I just joined to um, send some message, uh, something I forgot actually to mention at the beginning of the conference. So um, folks, uh, there's one important change in the schedule for tomorrow. So we have one presentation canceled and uh, let me check the timing so I can exactly tell you. So it's from Nelson. Unfortunately, we cannot uh, have had Nelson here. Um, it was a presentation called Mocking and Testing Async API Files with Microx. Um, if you feel bad about not hearing about Microx, don't do worry. The day after, day three, we will have uh, Laurent talking about Microx. So, but yeah, anyway, the most important, uh, 3.35 UTC tomorrow, we have 30 minutes uh, slot um, available for hire. <laughs> Uh, however that sounds. Um, so you can basically um, shout out in our socials or in our Slack if you are able to prepare a presentation uh, that is taking like 30 minutes um, and it's about Async API and Async API community, then let us know. Last year we had situation like this that we um, unfortunately had to cancel. I think we had two presentations canceled. But yeah, our community managed to jump in and we had actually two interesting uh, presentations. Um, so um, yeah, just remember folks, tomorrow we have 30 minute slot um, where we can accept a speaker. That's it. And yeah, 20, uh, I mean 40 past um, uh, and now I'm lost in time zones. Uh, uh, past two, uh, actually 14 uh, UTC. I see uh, Jonas laughing at me in the backstage, so I'm gonna let Jonas in. I would never laugh at you. Yeah. So, and <laughs> I could uh, never. Before we actually like, so is it like because I think I should say Jonas, but many people say Jonas, and now I say also Jonas, but I think it's Jonas, right? Of course. Yeah, I think it, it all I think it all comes down to your how you pronounce words in your native language. Yeah, yeah. So it kind like of in, in Danish, in, in Danish it's Jonas. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's Jonas, not Jonas. Yeah. So the, the Danish pronunciation is Jonas. Jonas. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Jonas. Yes. yes. Um, so Jonas, um, <laughs> the stage is yours again. I'm not gonna say what is the title of your talk. Um, <laughs> We're going to learn it from uh, from you in a sec. I'm going backstage and uh, the stage is yours, man. It's actually funny because the more I talk about or try to pronounce that word, the more often I fail to pronounce it correctly. So in case that you want an easier word, the easier word of, of this talk is the complexity of a single keyword within Async API. Or if you want to use Use the complex word. It's the int the intricacies. No, I can't even do it now. Now I think too much about it. The complexity of a single keyword. Let's just use that. So for let's see if my clicker works. There. So the complex keyword schema format. Well, what is it? In Async API, you can whenever you define the message payload of something, you can. You can customize how exactly you define that payload. For example, by default, even though that you never used this keyword before, by default, um, it will always be this async API schema object. Always is, and that is just the default format that it that the specification expects. But this keyword also allows you to define other formats in order to use the one that fits mostly within your use cases and how your organization works. So that's what I'm going to try to cover in this presentation. I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you to three different formats, which are three, a bit similar in some cases and very different in another. So I'm going to introduce those three formats, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, well, how does tooling handle something like this, where 
but you can have arbitrary schema formats and need to support all these kind of things. And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about, well, what's what kind of problems does this create for tooling? So by the end of the talk, I hope that at least you have learned these three schema formats and a bit of the pros and cons for the for all of them. So the three formats that I'm going to introduce are JSON schema and JSON type definition and Avril. Now JSON type definition, and that's kind of our async API schema object because the async API schema object is what we call a superset of JSON schema or more specifically draft seven. And the same have on the same uh, is for the open API 3.0 schema object that you can also reuse in, in async API. All these, all these, all these two formats basically just adds extra or restrict certain functionality within JSON schema. Now, what is JSON schema? Well, in the very abstract way, it's a validation system that allows you to constrain JSON data. Now, JSON type definition, that's a bit of both how you define data, but also how you can validate data. So it has a leg in both worlds. Then we have Avro. And Avro is a type of, well, it's sold as a serialization system. And it has multiple components that I'm going to introduce as well. And in that section, we also have, for example, XSD or Protobuf, which all defines the data structure. I'm going to start off with JSON schema, however because it's the one that's most widely used within async API and even open API. So it's important to get that foundation in place. So JSON schema, as I talked about before, um, through this schema format in async API, you can define that, well, we want our payload for this message. It must be, uh, or it's formatted using or described using a draft seven JSON schema format. So what is it? Well, in a very, very basic terms, as I introduced earlier, it's you validate data, you create a, a type of constraint on the data on the JSON data. For example, you can have this very simple type keyword called Boolean. Now Booleans just means that, well, all of my input data or instance data, for example, true and false, are validated against my schema. In this case, true and false both validate correctly or is valid against our schema. But something like a number 42, for example, is invalid against this schema because that type is not allowed. In JSON schema, there are basic seven types. We have a string which is a basic string uh, uh, string type. We have number and natural numbers. Then we have integer, which are only natural numbers. And the, it's not possible to define only floating point numbers. That's a bit of a constraint with JSON schema. It's only possible to define whether it's number or integer. Then we have that the, that the JSON data must be an object, for example, or an array or a Boolean. And then in the end, we have null, which is, well, we just, we are expecting a null value. So we, also, we already introduced this type number, which accurately, or in the last case, we introduced it with Boolean. In this case, it's a number. So 42 and 42.0 are valid inputs. And true is, well, that's invalid because we are expecting a number. We can also do a union of multiple types. So this means that you can, you can have, have it validate against numbers and strings. So it can both be a number, but it can also be a string. Then we have constant values. For example, if you expect that a specific JSON value 
to be present, you can define it using a constant keyword const. For example, I expect there to be 42. That's the only thing that's, uh, that's valid as an input. We can also say, well, we also have multiple uh, values that we accept, uh, for example, 42, but it could also be 43, for example. So those two numbers are the only one that's valid. And everything, is, uh, everything else is not. Then we have objects. So a JSON object is just, just a basic object which has a property, for example, in this case, it's test that has some value, also JSON value, of course. The first property that we're gonna look at is properties. So this one is, um, here we can define, well, if we encounter a property, for example, if we encounter test, it must be valid against whatever we define within here. So this means that whatever value within uh, the test property is validated against that internal schema here. We can also say, well, if there exists a property in the JSON object uh, as our input, what should it validate against when it haven't been defined within properties? And that is done through the additional properties keyword. We can also pattern match, for example, where we say, well, if the property starts with a lowercase uh, t, for example, in this case, then it must validate against whatever schema we define within here. Dependent schemas is, well, if this property is present, then it must, um, then it must validate against whatever is defined within here. We can also say dependent required, which is, well, if we have one property, for example, test, if that's present, then test two must also be present. And the properties that we defined up here are all optional. Not, none of them are, um, none of them are, required. So to set that, we use this required keyword where we can say, well, these properties must be present within my object. We also have some further constraints that we can set. For example, well, I want to have at least one property present, or I have at maximum five different properties present. Arrays. We have our items keyword, which then defines, well, what are the items that are allowed within, um, within this array that they must validate against? For example, in this case where we have a string and a number, well, then the items uh, keyword probably contains something like a union between type string and number or integer. We can also have additional items um, which means that if any of the items within the JSON array does not validate against uh, the schema that's defined within items, then we can use this additional item schema to validate those types of values. We can also say some further uh, information about this array, which is something like uh, you are only allowed to have unique items um, or whether you are allowed to have duplicate values within the array. And the same with as we had with properties, um, we can have a minimum and a maximum number of items within our array. For numbers, we have something like multiple of that the input at the JSON input must be a multiple of two can also say something about whether we have minimum or maximum uh, uh, as a value. For example, minimum and maximum are always inclusive. So this means that it's one inclusive. So it can be between one and five. You can also define exclusive minimum and maximums where you exclude one and five. So it can only be 
two, three, and four, for example. And then we have strings, JSON strings. Here we can say a little bit about, well, what's the length? How many characters are we expecting this uh, input JSON to have? And we can also say about, well, what's the maximum number of characters? We can also use one of the predefined formats for it. For example, I expect this to be an email, that this format is something that's predefined uh, within the JSON standard that defines how an email should look like. You can also customize it to be more and more precise to your specific use case, what you expect, and matching it using a regex. Then we have a bunch of other keywords as well. Something like all of, one of, any of, which are a way to apply these, apply subschema constraints or additional constraints to your data. For example, all of means that all of the uh, schemas within the array must be valid. Then we have, uh, for example, one of, which defines that, well, only one of these schemas in this array must be valid. And any of is the last one, which is, well, as long as it matches one of these schemas, then you're fine, all good. Then we also have this complex keyword called not, which is uh, a negation of the validation result. And we're gonna look at that later uh, to better clarify it. Then we have if, then, and else. Let's say that if, uh, if the value of a property is a specific value, then apply a certain constraint. And then I am saying validation. So what, what does that even mean? Well, let's try and look at a, at a very simple uh, JSON schema document and an instance data. Now we have the JSON schema to the left side, and then we have our instance JSON data that it's validated again, or that's being validated to the right side. Now the JSON schema standard is built upon validating these keywords one by one by tooling. So what this means is that well, we encounter the very first we encounter the very first keyword, which is well, type object. So we expect that the input data is an object in JSON. Well, we can see that it's definitely an object. So that one is valid. Then we reach the properties keyword. And this property keyword, then we iterate over all the different properties. Um, in there. So for example, we just check, well, does our input data have, um, does our input data have a display name property? Yep, definitely does. Okay, then we must validate it against the following schema here. In here, we first encounter the type string. Well, the value of the display name property is a string. So that's, of course, valid. The description is a kind of metadata information about it. And it doesn't, validation tools kind of ignore this. So this means that this entire schema is valid. And then we go over the email property because, well, do we have an email property within our input? We do. Perfect. So let's validate against the schema. And we start with the same thing as we did before with display name, type string. And that is, of course, valid. Then we look at the format email. Well, email matches against a very specific regex. And in this case, the input data or the value of email is definitely not an email. So here, it marks this as being invalid. So what happens now? Well, then we mark the entire schema as uh, the entire schema for the property email as being invalid here. 
okay? And that means that once it returns to the root object and there's nothing more to pass, well, we can say that the properties keyword uh, is invalid because, well, one of the properties didn't accurately validate against our constraint. And that means the entire root schema or the result of this validation is invalid. So let's try and emphasize this even more because I want to drive this. Uh, I'm using this as an example. Uh, so please, <laughs> please don't do this uh, in your in a production environment. It does nothing but create headaches. But there is specific use cases where not keywords can be very useful. But here I'm just using it as an example to really emphasize what validation means and what it means to um, to define message payload using JSON schema. So what happens here is that we have this double not keyword, which are nested. So let's try and go through everything again. The very same thing, the, the, uh, the internals of this not uh, schema is exactly the same thing as, as we saw it before. So I'm just gonna quickly go through it again. Well, the type object valid, display name is still valid. Then we have the email that becomes invalid. And then we go through the same thing. And now we return to our root object. Now this entire schema is invalid, but then we reach the not keyword. And what not does is basically negates the validation results. So this means that our in, uh, validation result are negated, which means that, well, this schema in here produce a valid validation result. And then we go through the last keyword, which is also a not, which again negates it. And then we have that the entire thing becomes invalid. And this is just to emphasize that you don't define the JSON structure with JSON schema or even async API schema object. You define the validation rules that the input data is uh, being constrained to. And we're going to look at what kind of problems that creates later on in tooling. So JSON schema is really, really good at validating uh, instance data. And it's really good at, at, at creating these uh, runtime constraints on our data. For example, if, else, um, and even, well, if this property is present, then the other property must be uh, present as well, etc. But for generating data models, because in async API, well, if you use spec first approach when you design your APIs, it means that that you use JSON schema to describe the constraints of the data, but you kind of don't want to manually create these data models that represents the data format for your message. And we're gonna look at that later. Next up, we have Avro. Yes, so Avro. So Avro is, a, well, it's a definition language. You define the data types here. And it has a little bit of um, special perspective, if I can call it that. So in async API, you can define this using this schema format, where we define it as an Avro and we're using version 1.9. Now, Avro is sold as a, as a system that comprises of multiple components. It's mainly used for serializing and deserializing data. And that's one of the strong suits. Now within this system, we have multiple components. And these components are, for example, the schema formats. That's the one I'm gonna to introduce today. And then it also has the uh, possibility of creating something like request response uh, calls. Uh, and other types of um, information within Avro. I'm gonna leave that out though. So we also have an interface description language 
are more tuned towards developers as it's more similar with common programming languages. And then of course we have the serialization and deserialization part. It has both serialization and deserialization to and from bytes, but also to JSON. And that's kind of the thing that I'm gonna um, mainly focus on. So the schema format is defined using a basic JSON, same as JSON schema, that's also JSON. And we start with some very basic types. We have null, which is, well, no value. Then we have a Boolean, which is, well, a binary value. Then we have an integer, which is a 32-bit signed integer. And then we have a long, which is, well, 64 bit. Then we have floating and double, which is single and double precision floating points. And then we have bytes, which is a, uh, a sequence of 8 bit, um, what's it called? Uh, 8 bit bytes. Then we also have string, which is, well, is just a sequence of characters. And here it defines that these are the data formats. This is not validation rules that we saw in JSON schema. This is what the, what the structure of the data is. It also has more complex types. For example, we can have unions even where, uh, well, it's one of multiple types. We can also have enums, which is in the basic terms is just constant set of uh, string values that you can have. We also have a race where you through the items keyword can define the structure of uh, the entries within this array. Then we have maps, which are, which is a single scheme. So the values, you can only define what the value type is, the key for uh, for the map is always strings. So in this case, it's for example, well, the values of this uh, map is long or double precision, uh, 30, what is 62 bit um, integer. Then we have records, which is something that's very similar to the JSON object, uh, but you can also think of it, of it as a, um, as an, well, you can think of it as an entry within a table or a row within a CSV file. Uh, so that's the record. Um, and yeah, here you can define certain fields, for example, username, email, same as we saw with JSON schema uh, that has the type string. Now to map the Avro types to all um, the the fields within a, a, a record, to map that into JSON types and examples, um, we can, for example, see that well, um, a record is an object, and it's um, well, it's a JSON object. Enums is just a basic string character that's constant. We also have array and array can of course be one of multiple types. And in the end, we have something called fixed and fixed is, it's just a fancy word of saying that it's a bite-sized type uh, to represent something like MD5 hashes. So Avro is really good when you want to generate code, for example, and when you want to serialize data models from those generated codes. but it's not great at, at validating data in more a constrained way that JSON schema is. Um, and yeah, then we have a type of, in the middle of the two formats that we got introduced, we have a JSON type definition. A JSON type definition is, um, it's for, it describes the shape of the JSON data. 
For example, we don't have in Async API, we don't have a specific format listed as that you can use for uh, JSON type definition. But it doesn't really matter that we define it from a standard perspective because you can always use custom keys here and tooling will, well, you can make the tooling understand it. Um, there are some keywords that I'm go not going to go with too much into details. We have some, uh, is a type nullable. Uh, we can also have references and even some extra data that you can define using the metadata keyword. But let's look at the basic types. We have, uh, and you can see these are very similar to the Avro types. We just have a few additions. For example, something like a timestamp uh, type. And we also have a more fine-grained control of the size of the uh, integers. JSON type definition has these type of forms. Now forms are basically just, for example, in this case, an empty form, which are rather easily mapped into a programming language. For example, for TypeScript, it's any. For Java, it's this um, generic object type. Um, and then we also have values, which are for, um, for defining a map of key value types. Then we have elements, which are basic lists. And then we have enums, for example, where it's also just only string values. And then we have the properties form, which are this, uh, well, it's for objects in JSON, where you can define, well, which kind of properties exist there. Um, all properties are by default required. And then you can use optional properties to define, well, optional properties. <laughs> um, and you can, of course, also define if none of these match, are there any additional properties that you allow in your uh, format? And JSON type definition is, well, it's really good at generating code, but it's also, uh, it also, it also has tooling for validating the data, even though that is a, um, a definition format. And this kind of leads me back to, well, these are the different, at least in different types where we have validation tool or validation schema, and then we have a definition language, and then we have a little bit of, of in between both. And yeah, tooling. How the hell do we handle this? In the parser, for example, it's possible to always define, or it's always possible to define a custom schema parser. For example, how do you parse a message that has uh, that matches this uh, schema format? Then you can create some custom uh, formatting logic and adapt the message object. Um, to be more accessible. I actually don't get this again. No, okay. I can't remember how much time I have left, so let's see. Problems, I said, yes. So we have a few issues with, with this feature. Uh, mainly it's because when, when you describe a message payload, are you really aware that you're defining validation rules if you don't define anything? And even the consumers of the document, like if you read the documentation for this, this it's not clear to me that it provide any value of, of only reading what, what, it, what the data can validate against. When, if you try to interact with the API, well, don't you want to know the structure of it? But it's kind of difficult, right? Because you can't have, at the moment, at least, it's not possible to have the best of both worlds, where you both have a, uh, the definition of the structure and the validation rules. And this is a bit of a problem. And especially for code generation, how do we generate code based on this schema here, where you have the double negation? You can, of course, expect to have something like, 
this interface type uh, payload, our model. But um, yeah, I see that we didn't have, it could also be something like glasses. Uh, what else? Yes. And well, we all know um, programmers are really stubborn and like the way their thinking is. So they want their format, they want their types that they think should be there. And there's nothing within, for example, JSON schema that enables you or helps you um, create these type of data models. And I think I'm going to skip this because I think I'm out of time, right? Yeah, I think so. Or at least right at the edge. So yeah, thank you for listening in. And I hope you got the introduction to the different schema formats and how they can be used and what some of the problems is for them. But yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Jonas. Um, You're welcome. Um, in the meantime, like, uh, so folks, if there are some questions, please ask them now. Um, but I, I have a suggestion for you, Jonas. So the, the example with JSON schema, not, not, etc. I think you, you, uh, you have, um, um, how to say it? You have a potential in. Um, uh, in your examples, uh, there's a potential in having a similar kind of um, hate speeches that people do about JavaScript. Uh, you probably saw some of these presentations about JavaScript, about none and all these different things, like what the fuck JavaScript is doing. So I think if you would do a presentation about like what the fuck a JSON schema and show some of those none, uh, not not, and then you how you showed it in our uh, React component, how it renders um, nested, um, that it would be a viral presentation. Not sure. I just know. want to emphasize: yeah. don't use it in production. Don't do it to your teammates. Don't use it. <laughs> it was just, just an example. <laughs> You're not good in making friends in JSON schema community. No, probably not. Um, but yeah, um, any questions? So I don't see any questions in the. Um, in YouTube chat. Um, can I see Slack? Nothing in Slack. So yeah, um, anyway, we're off time. Um, yeah, Jonas, again, thanks a lot for bringing these two different presentations today. It's It has been a lot of work, I bet. Um, so thanks for doing it. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. And um, um, folks, like, if you have some questions, like, you can um, see that Janos is an um, expert in these different standards. Um, you definitely should DM him whenever you have questions. And uh, yeah, thank you. And let's go for a break. And we start in um, nine minutes uh, with presentation from Luke from Lego, which will be, I bet, super interesting. See you after the break.
Hey folks, welcome after the break. Um, the next presentation uh, is from Luke um, that works at Lego Group. And the title of the talk is Cross-Domain Events with Async API and AWS. Um, it's a re pre-recorded presentation that we'll play, but um, like with other uh, presentations, uh, Luke is with us. So I will just now invite Luke from, um, from the backstage. And um, you folks remember that um, you can ask questions that Luke will answer after the presentation. But for now, let's let's invite Luke. Hey guys, hey can, you hear me? can you hear me all right? Um, sounds good on my side. Um, so yeah, before we play the recording, do you want to add something before say something? It's the stage is yours, so it's up to you. Amazing. Well, I mean, firstly, it's, it's great to be here. I've been watching a few of the talks already uh, this afternoon. Um, awesome conference and super smooth in terms of uh, live streaming, never an easy thing to get right. Um, and some great topics, right? Uh, great topics have come. Um, so I'm Luke. I work at um, the Lego Group currently. Um, so where am I? There's a few bits of Lego there in, in the background just as, as proof. Um, and yeah, in, in this talk, I'm, I'm going to um, present a little bit of work we did around um, sending events um, from one domain to another, so still within the organization. Um, and a key part of that, of course, is, is standardization. And so working with things like a async API, also uh, cloud events and, and JSON patch, JWTs, rooting our implementation standards has been super important um, to, to get that right. Um, so hopefully it's interesting um, and like the thing i love most about conferences is is the discussion after so please if you've got any questions or, or comments and i'd love to love to read them and um, have a bit more of a chat with you guys so thank you awesome thanks a lot for the intro luke so we're going backstage now and um, enjoy folks the, the presentation Hello everyone, great to be here today at the Async API Conf. Uh, my name is Luke, I work at the um, Lego Group as a lead engineer and I'm going to talk to you today about cross-domain events with Async API and AWS. So let's dive straight, straight in. So let's talk a little bit about event-driven architectures. Um, and I've broken this down into kind of two phases. Um, what we tend to see with adoption of um, EDAs. First phase is very much about events that happen within your domain, within your product, within your application. We make our inter-service um, communication event-driven a service. Fires an event, another service um, consumes that event. And that's, that's all good. That gets us used to this kind of event-driven way of working. Um, and then what we tend to see um, as our applications, as our EDAs mature and, and scale, is we start to see cross-domain events. So domain A sends events um, and domain B consumes those events. And here, what we start to see is the real power of EDAs begin to be unlocked. Um, and that's really what I want to talk to you today about is those cross-domain events and how we can manage those at scale. So a little bit of context about um, the experience I'm basing um, this talk on. I work on the payments platform um, at Lego, at the Lego Group. And we were, we were tasked with um, with this task uh, to produce rich payment events in real time to consumers via a transport that, that is convenient to them. So we're going to look at um, each of those little pieces. We'll, we'll break that down um, and see kind of the, the sort of solution that, that we put in place. A little bit more context. So these are the kind of domains that that we're working with here. We've got the payments domain in the middle of the screen there. Um, and so that's kind of going to be the, the central point of this talk. That's going to be the producer 
of our um, cross domain events. And we've got a couple of other domains here in the in the flow of a, a payment and, and an order um, on lego.com. The, the baskets domain, they'd be responsible for the front end on the checkout process on lego.com um, and the order submission over to the to the orders domain. And what we're really interested in here, the, the particular event um, that we're going to focus on is this, the idea of a, a payment being authorized. So once you've made a, um, a request to pay for um, some Lego with your uh, preferred payment method, that payment request will go off to, um, if it's a credit card payment, to say the issuer of the card and, and, the, and the bank. Um, and if everything is okay with that payment, um, we, we class that payment as being authorized. And at that point, um, the payments platform would receive um, an authorized event from a third party. And we, as a payments platform, need to, to tell our consumers about that successful payment authorization. And the baskets domain is, um, is really the domain that's, that's interested. Um, once they have that successful payment authorization, then the order submission can take place and the Lego will be on its way to you. So before we had this event-driven Nirvana, there was um, uh, an existing solution. That was very much a pool-based solution where the, the baskets domain, after submitting a payments request, would continually poll the payments platform to ask, has that payment been authorized? And they would keep asking that until the payments platform had received the upstream event that the payment has been had been authorized. And we would send that status back in, in response to the um, to the request from the baskets domain. And then, then we can see there the um, order submission would, would continue after that. That poll based pool based mechanism um, puts a lot of emphasis on the basket uh, the baskets domain um, there's inefficiencies there um, there's there's time um, spent uh, for a shopper on the on the checkouts page waiting for that response to come back um, a lot of things to a lot of things to improve um, and that's where a pushed based um, event driven mechanism um, works a lot lot better so the baskets domain would, would submit their payment request um, as usual and then just wait, wait for a response um, uh, for, for an event, for an, a notification from the payments domain that that payment um, had been authorized and then the flow continues. So this is the event driven cross domain um, solution we've, we've ended up with. Now there's a few properties, that, a few desirable properties that we're going to be looking for as we build out a cross-domain um, uh, event-driven architecture. Of course, events need to be consumable, but the um, process with which a consumer can set up consumption of events needs to be simple. Um, and what we talked about there when we when we looked at the original task was that familiar delivery, uh, the transport that was convenient for um, our consumers. There's lots of different ways to deliver events. There's lots of queuing systems, message delivery systems, event buses. Um, and it's about, so, you know, if you're developing your own solution for cross domain events, the best tech for you and your consumers is going to be the, the one that, that, that should win out. What we didn't want to do here in our case was introduce, um, an event delivery system that was unfamiliar to our consumers um, and, and introduce additional tech burden upon them. Events need to be discoverable, and well documented. This is something we'll we'll look closely at, and where Async API really really helps us out. Um, and standards standards is so important when we're dealing with cross domain events. It's important when we're dealing with inter domain events. Um, but even more so in terms of cross-domain events, because having a standard way to um, design, define, deliver um, events makes them interoperable, interoperable, makes them portable across systems. Um, 
it gives us a shared language between producer and consumer and it makes them predictable um, and that's also where versioning kind of um, complements that standardization um, it's all about uh, making events predictable um, event payloads predictable and maintaining backwards compatibility whenever possible not breaking um, uh, event handling when we change event payloads and uh, message structures security is super important um, especially in the domain that, that we were looking at and uh, kind of dealing with payments data um, but whenever we're uh, delivering messages across the main um, in particular security is really important we need to um, protect any um, data that's in those event in those events treat any data as, as sensitive in in this respect um, and because the uh, event is likely to be received um, via a public endpoint um, messages need to be verifiable uh, um, you can imagine that someone would be able if they knew the domain uh, if they sorry if they knew the API endpoint um, they could post a message um, but we want to provide a, a mechanism for our consumers to verify that it's from a the message is from a trusted source and we'll look at how we achieve that scalable we're talking about pretty high volume here in terms of um, payments events through through lego.com through the um, use case we that we're looking at that's super important any event driven system is likely to need to deal with with high volume that's the nature of um, events and resilient um, the the payment authorization event that we're looking at here um, is very critical um, that is the link between the payment request and the the order for your lego going out um, so any missed events can mean uh, disruption to uh, a shopper's order so we need to build a, a event um, delivery system that's tolerant of, of faults of network errors we need to be able to replay missed events um, we need to be highly available at all times really so what we're going to do we'll focus on a few of those points um, the first one we're going to look at is that standardization because it, it really is so so important when we're dealing with events there's there's tons of ways in which we can express event payloads so adding standard um, standard specifications around that is is super important and this of course brings me on to async api and the reason we're we're here at this at this great conference um, now the async api spec most of us are going to be familiar with that but this has really become the industry standard for defining asynchronous apis just as open api has has served as well in terms of um, synchronous apis request response um, apis async api really shining um, when it comes to asynchronous apis and there's this growing ecosystem of tools um, for building these these event driven apis and and for operating them and that's what's great about async api there's this whole community around it um, and i feel like we're really just at the beginning of of what's possible here um, and it's great to be a part of that and, and being a user and a, a contributor so um, that's that's really great um, and if you haven't tried out async api definitely go ahead and and do that after after the conference here we have a, a a small example of what an async api um uh schema would would end up looking like and this was a, a, you know a um a slimmed down version of of what we ended up with the, with this payment um authorized event um now when we talked about the event delivery system and 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 the need for a kind of familiar transport amazon event bridge um became the obvious choice for us so if you're not familiar with event bridge it's a serverless event bus um and it has this really powerful um mechanism for filtering which is which is based on rules and, and pattern matching um, and it's fast becoming the go-to application integration um tool 
within 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 AWS, um, and it's kind of taken some of the um, uh, use cases away from things like SQS, SNS, Kinesis, which which you may have uh, come across or, or used in the past. Now, EventBridge was was in use internally within the payments domain, but also with within um, our consuming domains. So it definitely became the obvious choice. There was no new tech to introduce. Um, and internally within the payments domain, we already had events flowing through um, our private event buses that we could subscribe to and, and transform and send on downstream. And another key benefit of EventBridge is that it allowed us to target AWS workloads. So we could um, target, go from an event bus in our account, in our AWS account, into an event bus in another AWS account, i.e. the, the baskets domain. We could do that event bus to event bus. Um, but it also allowed us to target consumers who were perhaps not using AWS or not using event bridge and we could do that via a um, regular http request using a feature of event bridge called api destinations and here we see an example of um, an infrastructure as code definition um, for provisioning a, um, a a rule on an event bus in event bridge so we can see here um, again, a very simplified example, but we've got the payments public event bus defined there. We have the target of the buckets public event bus, um, buckets, baskets, sorry, public event bus, and the event pattern. So we're saying here, send all events from payments through to the baskets domain that match this um, event type, payment authorized ecom or or e-commerce those are the payments that the baskets domain are interested in particular so you can see that kind of powerful um, filtering system uh, coming into play there and we'll, we'll dive into the detail of what um, an event um, could look like as well and that's really where cloud events comes in um, so cloud events um, similar to, to async api is um, is this kind of industry standard, industry leading um, specification. Um, but whereas async API is for the kind of wrapper around your API, the, the API itself, um, cloud events deals with the the, the payload um, of an event, the, the, the event data itself. And it gives us a common way um, to define all the fields in, in that payload. An event payload is is often this kind of unstructured um, JSON object or um, and, 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 and you know the, the, the keys used um, were, were completely up to the producer. The consumer would kind of have no idea um, what format the event was going to kind of turn up in um, without reading um, documentation. And what we see here is if, if, if that's the case, if there's no standard way of defining the, the keys in a, and the values in, a, um, in an event payload, the complexity for a consumer to handle those events um, is, is huge. Um, each event needs to be handled in a, in a different way. Um, we can't standardize um, any of the handling logic whereas when we use when we introduce cloud events that complexity and that amount of handling logic is is drastically um, reduced so here we can see uh, you know a basic example of what a cloud events um, payload would look like um, you've kind of these are most of these are you know typical uh, um, uh, standard um, keys in in the in the payload and we have um, some non-standard some custom ones as well and they just sit alongside the the standard keys in in the root um, so item potency key is a um, is one that we've introduced to this event and we'll get on to kind of what the how we generate some of um, some of these um, fields in our event payloads we'll get on to that a little bit a little bit later on but you can see here the the, the type of the event coming through here and the source. Um, so a lot of these things will 
will look familiar. So the first thing we had to do when we decided on, on these various technologies and, and specifications, we had to kind of trace our way across the, th across the three um, specs and find the commonality, map the map between the fields, uh, the field names um, that were defined in each um, in each spec, um, and that would give us that um, consistent thread across across each of these across each of these things. Um, so you can see here we have this concept of channels and a channel in async API, and that maps very neatly to the concept of, of rules in event bridge. Um, and um, in terms of the type of event, we see message uh, properties of the message in async API mapping to a detail type in event bridge and a subject in cloud events. And the, the payload itself uh, in async API, we, we kind of um, we would define the payload within the the properties key under under message. Eventbridge calls that detail, and Cloud Events calls that data, and time is is more or less the same uh, across Eventbridge and Cloud Event. But this was really key to us unlocking um, our understanding of how um, uh, the definition of an event could be consistent and and um, uh, coherent across these these three things. So if if you're kind of just getting started with async API and cloud events, and you have another technology in the middle, this is a really useful exercise to to go through. So if we we zoom out a little bit and kind of um, introduce this this diagram, this is kind of the the high level flow that we ended up with in terms of our cross domain events. So on the left hand side here, we have our event sources, and these are internal to our domain, to, to the payments domain. So events really could be coming from anywhere within our within our domain. And indeed, they could also be coming from external sources such as our third party payment providers. Um, we route those events to our what we call our private event bus. So that's an event bus that's just available to services and consumers within our domain. We um, have a rule then um, on that event bus, and that would match all the events that we are interested in. So all those payment authorized events. We send that off to a, an AWS service called Step Functions, which is essentially um, a state machine based workflow engine so you can imagine just um, uh, a flow of, of different um, transformation steps on uh, the data in that event obviously if we remember back to the previous slide the fields mapping the um, structure of the event payload in event bridge is is very different to the, the cloud events structure. So what we're doing in this workflow is is mapping that um, event bridge, event payload over to the cloud events payload, which we're going to push out to our consumers. Um, and the second kind of step that we have in that step functions workflow is a kind of encryption um, step um, using JSON web tokens. And we'll get into the detail of that a little bit later. So once those events are, are transformed and, and encrypted, we send those on to the public event bus. Now the public event bus is where we have rules set up targeting our downstream consumers. So that could be the, the baskets domain or any other domain that, that was interested in, in payments events. And again, that's all rule driven. So we saw that example of a rule with the, the baskets domain subscribed to payment authorized e-com e-commerce events we could also have um, another consumer perhaps who was um, uh, interested and in subscribed to um, a point of sale pos um, payment events so these are just some some high level examples and we can see on the far side the those event targets either a um, uh, another AWS account, another event bridge, event bus, 
uh, or the HTTP API destination. Let's look at um, discovery next. So, um, big part of of allowing our consumers to to discover our um, domain events is, of course, documentation to discover and adopt those events and consume those events. Documentation is obviously super important, and we wanted a way in which we could um, uh, automatically generate documentation that was really clean, really simple, and um, had examples in there as well, because examples make such a difference when you're talking about API documentation. A lot of it can seem abstract until you see that concrete example. Luckily for us, we defined our event-driven API using an async API. Um, so an async API um, uh, provides a generator tool. Um, you can generate tons of different things with that tool, um, but you can all but you can also generate um, HTML uh, pages um, that end up looking like this. So we take our async API spec and we generate an HTML uh, website um, based on that spec. So all of this content that you see on, on the page here, that was all automatically generated just from our specification. And that can be updated in our delivery pipelines as the, as the underlying spec changes. And we get nice examples of um, those different events as well. <laughs> Another um, tool in our tool belt is um, Backstage, which was uh, originally developed at, at Spotify as a way of um, distributing and accessing um, API documentation across um, the Spotify organization. They've open sourced that tool, and, and so anybody can kind of um, spin up their own Backstage instance. We've done that at Lego. Um, and so once we've, um, once we've, uh, created our async API, um, spec specification, generated our documentation, we can upload that to the base plate and that's accessible to any other engineers within Lego, um, but not publicly accessible. So offers, offers out of the box discoverability and, um, security on, on that documentation. The other thing I wanted to touch on here was um, uh, the concept of event hierarchy. Obviously, we know that naming things is, is very difficult in software engineering, and um, event types are, are no different. And there's many, many ways in which we can um, name events. Um, there's, there's, there's been different um, formats for doing that. What I would say is choose one that, that works for you but what we found um was a very kind of powerful pattern was this kind of concept of topical hierarchy so we kind of um see some examples here where we've got the entity and then the event name itself and then some metadata and um, by um kind of using this dot notation format um we can we see some really powerful um, filtering patterns um, applied um, internally within our domain, but also um, for our consumers. They can be as granular as they need to be when subscribing to events. So you could subscribe to all payment events, all um, events about a particular entity or domain. You could subscribe to all authorized events within that payments domain. Or you could be very granular and say, I just want to um, subscribe to the e-commerce payment authorized events or the point of sale authorized payments events. A really powerful technique there. Um, and it might be of use in, in your applications. Another key point um, on, on discoverability is um, the evolution of your event schema, of your event payload changes to your event obviously happen, especially at scale, as those events try to cater for more and more diverse consumers. <clears throat> so what 
the kind of um, strategy that, that we've settled on is to um, handle changes to events via additions wherever possible. So to only be additive to our events when we need to introduce a new field rather than replacing an old field, add it along alongside wherever possible. And if you do need to make breaking changes, such as removing a field or renaming a field or changing the, the type of a, uh, of a value of a field. Um, so if those breaking changes really are necessary, then the, um, the sort of best strategy, the optimum strategy there is to introduce a new event type. And again, you can kind of use any naming or versioning um, uh, mechanism that, that makes sense for you um, but yeah make sure you're introducing new event types um, if there are breaking changes and what what you can do to to help your consumers even further is produce the old event and the new event simultaneously for the time it takes the new event to be adopted fully and the old event to to um, cease being uh, consumed and that really minimizes disruption so um, it, it, it doesn't put any pressure on the consumer to, to upgrade their, their consumption of, of the new event. Um, they can do that in their own time. And also it doesn't hold up development on, on the, on the producer side. They've made the new event available and it's now up to the consumer to, to, um, subscribe to that new event. Um, and, and in terms of then circling back to the async KPI. Um, version, the version of your event-driven um, API, that then can be incremented accordingly. So if you have introduced a new event, you would tend to uh, move to the next major version. Updates to events, we can uh, stay on the same major version and increment the minor version. And any fixes to events or um, uh, to endpoints, we would see that as a as a patch um, version so let's take a look at enrichment should be a really um, interesting topic so we saw um, in our um, the flow diagram of um, our cross domain events we had that um, step functions workflow running to transform our event from the incoming format in event bridge to the outgoing cloud cloud events um, format and of course as well as just kind of transforming there's there's also um, uh, usually enrichment um, we want to derive values of fields from other fields um, we want to change and operate on on certain uh, certain field values and often to to achieve this we need to introduce a lot of kind of custom business logic and there's a ton of ways to do this there's a ton of ways to write this logic and often as that logic grows in complexity the event payloads themselves expand um, the risk of um, changing and updating that um, enrichment logic increases and these are things that are really easy to 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 um, get wrong field names are very susceptible to inadvertent change as our field values and any changes that are inadvertent um, can can be catastrophic for consumers if they're expecting a field uh, named client id with an uppercase i and lowercase d and they get client id with an uppercase d these kind of innocuous um, uh, differences can be can be um, can be pretty catastrophic to the to the consumer. So what we were looking for was a way to do that in a standards based way, um, driven by schemas, um, a, a common language and a common method for um, performing uh, enrichment on our events. And what we settled on was um, a standard called JSON patch. So JSON patch um, comes with a number of different operations. I've listed them here. Add, remove, replace, copy, move. So uh, pretty much everything you would need in terms of um, 
uh, enrichment of and transformation of event payloads. And you can, um, you'll be seeing an example here of, of this apply patch method being used um, from a JSON patch library. We take the inbound, we take the inbound event and we apply the um, transform patch um, to the to the to that inbound event. So if we if we take the um, uh, order ID field, for example, this is how it would come to us in the top level order ID. And we see here on the, the third line um, the uh, of the patch, we have the operation to move the order ID from that root field to the nested path at um, slash data slash order ID. So pretty simple operations there, but this has given us now a standard way to, to express those. So any engineers coming to update this, um, they can read it, understand it immediately. Um, it's very trackable through um, source control and, peer, and pull, pull request reviews. It really reduces the risk of um, errors. Event IDs um, is another thing I want to touch upon here. So, again, th this is this is um, a, a key piece of information in your event. It identifies um, your event uniquely, um, and you know th you can choose a wide array of of different values to to kind of generate an event ID. But what we settled on was um, a spec called ULID, universally unique lexographically sortable identifiers and there's a there's a couple of really cool things about these so they're base 32 encoded so the the string is fairly succinct although um highly unique and um really low um or really high collision resistance right and another really interesting property of ulid ids is that they can be chronologically um sorted so um, event IDs um, generated with different timestamps can can then be sorted, and we find that's actually a really good, a really useful property for for our consumers to to have that additional um, uh, capability for for sorting incoming events. Item potency is another um, topic you you can't avoid talking about in terms of of, of event driven messaging. Um, and particularly cross cross the main events. So we in the um, uh, payments domain as as event producers in this um, uh, in this example, um, we we had a situation where we could not guarantee exactly once um, message delivery, and that was for a, a few different reasons. You know, third parties couldn't offer us the same guarantee, or um, services we were using within AWS couldn't offer that guarantee so we had a situation where we could be sending the same event to um, our consumers uh, more than once so we had to give away we had to give our consumers a way um, to to know if they'd already seen um, an incoming event or not so they would um, check the event have i already seen it no okay carry on processing it yep i've already seen it okay that's fine i don't need to continue processing it um, and we um, we put an item potent item potency key in our every single uh, event that we send to our consumers and the value of that key um, has to be deterministic so it has to be the same for every single instance of that event even if the event is sent multiple times the event ID could be unique but the item potency key must be exactly the same. And this is what a consumer can um, verify whether they've already seen an event um, with. And we use an MD5 based um, content hash for that. So we take the content of the event, which will always be the same, regardless of how many times we send the event, and we create a hash of that, um, of that event content. And that's an example of how, how it comes out.
Okay, so on to security. Um, this is a, a, a short section, but obviously a very important section, important section of, of the talk. So I touched on this briefly um, uh, earlier in the talk, but our um, strategy for securing our events um, centered around um, JSON web tokens and a um, kind of um, uh, a special way of um, producing JSON web tokens called nested JWTs. So with with JWTs, you can you can sign those JWTs and you can encrypt them. But really, what we wanted to do was both. So we wanted to nest an encrypted JWT within a signed um, JWT. So that's the concept of of nested JSON web to nested JSON web tokens. Um, so in terms of signing our event, that is. Um, that allows us our consumers to ask the question when they receive an event, is this event from a trusted source? Did this event come from the payments domain? Should I um, trust it? Is it safe and secure to process it? And so when we sign our event payload, we do that with a private key and we share the um, corresponding public key with our consumers and they can then verify that. Um, sig that signature with um, our public key. And then we encrypt that signed JWT with a shared HMAC secret. We sh share that secret with our, our consumers and that allows them to decrypt the event once they've received it. And another bonus you see here in the bottom right is that it, that's an example of a, of a JWT. So it's consistent, it's always going to be the same size, it's highly compressed um, compared to you know the raw event. Um, and that's kind of an added bonus of using JWTs. Obviously we're using them for, for security, but that encoding, that compression um, is, is really useful when you're transmitting um, data of a variable size um, to, to consumers um, over, an, over the network. Um, testing, another super important um, topic really in, in terms of um, cross-domain events. Um, we kind of used a varied um, testing strategy. Linting um, was a big part of that, so we can use this tool called Spectral to lint our async API specifications to make sure it, it kind of adheres to, to various rules and, and formats. Um, we can also validate event payloads. So we were looking at uh, the enrichment um, earlier, and we can also define our events as JSON schema documents. And when we enrich our events and when we um, produce our event payloads, we can then validate that enrichment process against a JSON schema definition of our events to make sure that the, um, the transformation and the um, resulting event payload adheres to the rules in that schema. Um, and we, we do that in our unit tests, pre-deployment of, of our, our solution, but we can also do that at, at runtime as, as well. Um, now it's really key uh, in terms of testing event-driven systems to test your integration points. We kind of see two types of integration point. Um, uh, um, in terms of testing, uh, integration points that we can test at, at build time via uh, our infrastructure's code tests, and at runtime, um, where we actually test deployed resources. Um, contract testing is another really um, powerful approach to when it comes to testing um, event-driven systems and, and cross-domain events. So what we can do here is put an event contract between our producers, uh, between our producer and our um, event consumers. And uh, essentially a contract in this case would, would be um, the JSON schema document um, definition of our, of our event. Um, we place that in a, in a central 
uh, registry where producers can distribute the contract and consumers can access that contract. And then we run tests against those contracts um, from our, our systems under test. So we can simulate um, uh, event production or event consumption. And then based on the, um, the production or consumption of that event, we can verify that and validate that against our, um, against our contracts. Observability, now it's, uh, observability really works in tandem with testing. So um, the areas we don't test or, or are very difficult to test an event-driven system, we make sure we optimize in terms of monitoring and, uh, and alerting. Um, and as we're running on AWS, we can leverage a lot of service, uh, default service metrics to monitor the health of the resources in that um, event pipeline. We were, we configure alarms uh, on those on those key metrics, things like um, undeliverable events and the transformation workflow failures. We also we also use custom metrics a lot to to kind of collect different data points about the application. Um, and performance, of course, another critical thing for us to to monitor. Um, we want to make sure that our events are being delivered in a timely manner and are indeed being delivered at all to our um, our downstream consumers. Um, we do that through uh, distributed tracing and um, dashboards as well. Okay, brilliant. So I think we're, we're almost at time. So um, a quick recap of what we looked at today. We've looked at how we use async API to define, document and distribute our event-driven APIs. We've looked at cloud events, the structure and event payloads in a common way. We've looked at EventBridge. We've looked at JSON patch for standards-based event enrichment. Um, we've looked at JWTs for, secure, for securing our event delivery. We've looked at um, test strategy and, and how we balance that with, with observability as well. And that's all I had time for. Um, you can grab these slides by um, via this QR code um, and if you like the talk there's there's always more of, of this stuff um, from me on Twitter so thanks so much for listening and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference um, hey folks um, thanks a lot for watching uh, this amazing presentation from Luke uh, like he covered so many uh, interesting topics All, always this uh, case study use case based presentations are amazing um the problem is i don't see luke uh in the backstage i think he dropped off at the beginning of the presentation and also i don't see him active in slack so which means he has some uh, uh, technical issues not a big problem because anyway uh, we had to um we it's a time for a break so but i promise like i cross my heart uh, whatever I have to say, I'll make sure that uh, the questions that you had are answered in our Slack in Conference 2022 channel. And additionally, I swear that I for sure will uh, chase Luke and also Giovanni from Lego that are in our Slack. And I'll make sure that we have this officially like a case study documented on the website because uh, there was a lot of uh, nice and good knowledge in the stock. Um, before we go into the break, uh, I mean, you can already stop listening to me and just go for a break. Cause, but anyway, like in seven minutes, we have another talk, but I will not be the one that introduced the talk. So remember, Async API conference is a, it's a conference, uh, driven by the community for the community. So I'll, it's my last, that was my last uh, presence on stage. Um, the rest of the conference today will be, um, uh, coordinated by Fran. And tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, there will be different people running the conference. So um, thanks for being here. Thanks for um, listening. Um, for tomorrow, remember, I'm, I'm, I'll be here tomorrow, but it's because I present about the state of Async API. And also um, important, something that I said already in the a few hours ago, uh, remember, we have one free slot for tomorrow. 
the talk from Nelson about Microx got cancelled. So if there's anyone who has a topic and wants to jump in and take this free 30 minute slot tomorrow, um, yeah, shout out, let us know. Um, and that's it, yeah, a five minutes break. And arrivederci. <laughs>
of all, I'm hoping that uh, this is connected now. Um, if not, please let me know in the chat. Um, well, um, I would like to say that um, thanks a lot, um, Lucas, for taking this whole half of the of the conference today. Take care of your voice, mate, because you really sounded like uh, tired. So, so yeah, <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Um, our next talk is uh, from Jesse Menin. Let me check the title again because if I keep forgetting it. So, Async API as a driver of the SDLC, so Software Dev Development Lifecycle. And uh, I got a um, quick uh, surprise, a uh, little surprise. So, um, just uh, oh, let, let me invite first uh, Jesse into stage uh, for quick uh, hello. Okay. Hey, Nick. Uh, hey, friend. How are you, man? Uh, let me put it like this so people can see the logos and everything. But <laughs> so I guess I'm doing a little bit spoiler there with my name and screen. But uh, look who I have here with me. So, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, I, I came to Barcelona in the end. Uh, I couldn't resist. So I'm here with Stephen as well. And uh, I have some other friends here from the community as well. I have uh, Peter Parquez from the community. And uh, Ahmad, and probably Ahmad Javid, uh, no, Ahmad Javid, and uh, no more delay, no more uh, time. Uh, Jesse, uh, let's talk after uh, your talk. Sounds good? Sounds great. Yeah. Okay, thanks, man. See ya. Hey, everyone. This is Jesse Menning. I'm excited to, hear, to be here to talk to you about Async API and its role that we see in driving the SDLC lifecycle, the software development lifecycle. So it's interesting cruising around uh, on the internet looking for things uh, related to this talk, and, and we see a lot of things about lifecycles. Uh, and one of my favorite things I found actually was from Ken Lane. Uh, Ken Lane uh, is works for Postman and does a lot of thinking about uh, API lifecycle more more generally. Uh, and sort of evangelizes the use of, uh, of APIs. And I found this uh, really cool uh, diagram here that includes the Postman Spaceman. That's why there's a couple of astronauts uh, interacting there. And you can see that there's two interacting life cycles. This is for, for an API. Uh, you, can start, you can usually visualize things that starting on the left. Uh, you need a producer in order to have a consumer. Uh, and he sort of steps you through the different stages of a API. And then and once the API is distributed over on the right side, uh, there's a consumer lifecycle. Uh, and it's, of course, Ken does a great job of explaining things uh, and, and walking through how things uh, give are given birth to and, and uh, so go through a life cycle and then uh, eventually presumably die after they're, after they're uh, no longer needed. And it's interesting, we're seeing, uh, talking with with people who are in, interested in event-based uh, APIs, that there's this big desire uh, to bring these kind of life cycles into event-driven uh, worlds as well, using primarily actually async API. And, and even more so is combining those two worlds of, of sync APIs and async APIs. I can't tell you the number of, of uh, people I've talked with that want a single you know, one-stop shopping for uh, APIs, whether they're synchronous, asynchronous, whatever they are, they want to have a one one place where a developer can go in and uh, and pick something that makes sense for their for their particular use case uh, and and get access to that information very very easily. Uh, so it's an exciting time, as we all know, for uh, event-driven architecture more generally and event-driven APIs as well. But thinking through it. Uh, it's interesting that there seems to be an interrelated life cycle here as well. Uh, and I'll focus here on the, on the producer life cycle. Uh, there's certainly a correlate over to the consumer as well, but we'll just, you know, for scope, focus on the producer life cycle. And the, that is as long as we are advertising these, uh, these APIs, these event APIs, um, we need to actually have the ability to process them. In other words, if we can think of the, the API in a, a classical sense, uh, it's the interface, but we still need a, uh, an implementation to make these things real. 
And those implementations actually have their own separate and distinct uh, life cycle as well, which is as important as our, our, our API life cycle. You know, if we don't have the, the meat in the sandwich, the sandwich is just kind of bread and, and, and sits there a little bit. So, and obviously, you know, these event-driven applications, if you're a, a any size enterprise, you're going to want to have multiple environments and test these things and integration test them uh, and have a sandbox environment where your developers can, can go wild and, and explore ideas. And so you're going to need to have this lifecycle exist in multiple different places and have it be repeatable as you, uh, as you so desire. So uh, thinking more about that and, and sort of the, the implications and challenges of that, and that's sort of the, the basis of this talk. How do we interrelate async API, the producer API, API uh, cycle, and then also sort of the, the event-driven application implementation cycle as well. So just give me a high-level overview. What are the goals here? Well, talk briefly about async uh, SDLC without async API. Certainly a lot of people try to do that. Uh, talk a little bit about the challenges uh, in, uh, in that regard. Talk about why async API helps solve the challenges associated with uh, with SDLCs, and finally, you know, room for growth, of course. Uh, challenges that I see in terms of the async API spec and using it for for SDLC. So, plunging right in, let's talk just a little bit briefly uh, about what uh, an async SDLC looks like without async API. Because uh, for a long time, you know, we've had async architectures and we haven't had async API. So what does that look like? I think the underlying challenge is that there is typically some infrastructure that's associated with async architectures. I mean, you know, certainly brokered architectures, which is kind of the world I live in. You know, As you're moving things through environments, we have to make sure that things are in lockstep. Things like queues and topics and endpoints and security. And you know, just there's a lot of configuration that's typically involved with moving an async uh, application uh, through environments. And that's a great thing. I mean, all the, all the uh, infrastructure serves a purpose and I think a, a really great purpose. And since you're listening to the Async API conference, I assume I, I don't have to tell you all about that, but it, the, the decoupling is, fantastic, but it's also creating this sort of shared touch point between a whole bunch of different uh, different applications that don't necessarily know about each other. That's you know, decoupling. Uh, so it becomes a, a bit more of a challenge in terms of uh, moving things through an SDLC. How do people solve it? Well, there's the classic, we're going to roll our own approach. And certainly I've worked for a lot of people who have tried that. You know, there's a, a custom proprietary Java or Java, you know, JSON format that people use to describe things or the properties of the, the application as it moves through environments. And, you know, there's custom scripting that processes, the, processes those. A lot of times that that revolves around the sort of raw object definition, definition language of the particular broker that you're dealing with. And that, that's a, a viable option, but I would argue that that's actually kind of a constraining uh, option as well. So let's move on. How could async API help standardize SDLC? Uh, I aggressively have stolen <laughs> slides from Fran uh, because I think A, he has a lot prettier slides than I typically, would typically produce. And I think also that it shows that a lot of the concepts that are central to async API that, that Fran eloquently talks about on a daily basis can be applicable not only to the interfaces of applications, but used for the implementations as well. So here you go. Here's Fran's slide on the purpose of, uh, of async API. And you can say event-driven mi microservices, Internet of Things APIs, streaming APIs, and pretty much anything based on messages. And I'll sort of glow those things out there. Uh, those microservices and pretty much any system based on messages, you know, you know, once we move beyond the pure API use of, of async API, we very quickly move into a realm where we're introducing implementation. And here's another slide that I stole from Fran. It says, you know, the specification is protocol agnostic, which I think is fantastic. Uh, it avoids vendor lock-in, lock makes it, you know, sort of uh, generalizes things, uh, big points there. Uh, and as Fran says, Fran Mendez, uh, Protocol information is important for implementation details, but it shouldn't be a blocker for defining the interface. Absolutely. 
don't worry about it until later. But the correlate is eventually you're going to have to have a protocol or nothing is going to work. You're going to be shouting into the void. And that's, that's from Jesse Many. So how do we bridge that gap in async API? Well, thankfully, we have a fantastic solution for it. We are protocol agnostic, but we also have binders uh, that allow us to define things in an open standard, best practice kind of way. And I think it's, think it's, it's amazing because of the open source nature of things, you get the best of knowledge from an IBM expert, IBM MQ expert about like, this is what matters when you're defining an IBM MQ and a Kafka expert. I don't know as much about Kafka as I should. So like I get to rely on people who care deeply about Kafka and, and its bindings to figure out like, these are the important things that we should be thinking about when we're configuring Kafka and AMQP and that's, you know, the, the list goes on and on. And that, that binding can, you know, configure, because uh, we're at different levels, we can configure sort of uh, queue level things, we can configure server level. Uh, it's pretty fantastic just to, to have that access to that knowledge. And the, the spec serves the, the purpose pretty well. I mean, uh, in its original and current uh, conception, the spec represents a file per application. Uh, and so, yeah, this can be the app, you know, how you interact with the application, but it also can really lead you on the right, correct, correct path for implementation, or at least give you a head start for it and give you the associated infrastructure. And, you know, we have a, a, an info object that can give you a little bit more detail about the, the implementation and also provides versioning information, which is uh, uh, pretty key as we sort of move into a multi-environment, uh, situation. The, the versioning above and beyond what you know a GitHub uh, branch would tell you, uh, semantic version becomes really really key. So we're looking at some really good good uh, good baseline here for uh, things that could drive your SDLC. Then I think the final uh, component of it is the tooling. I mean I, we talk all the time about the the great nature of the community here, and I think that's uh, that's uh, uh, evidence of it. You know, rather than having to create the wheel over and over again at every different company or every different initiative, we have tooling that, you know, creates things automatically. And uh, I think a fantastic example of that is code generation. And to sort of break up me ta talking for, for forever, I'll show you a brief little demo of uh, something that we did at Solace that leverages not only the open source code generation, but, you know, async API produces a, uh, or, or hosts actually, a endpoint that will uh, create a, uh, a code package for you. So that in just a little bit. So what's the conception here? The conception is that, you know, and this is a very, very generic uh, SDLC and some very specific uh, different logos here, but you can envision this could be, you know, uh, your own custom SDLC, uh, and it could also be your own custom logos in terms of the tools you use. But using async API each step along the way here to to interact um, with the lifecycle, and rather than having a proprietary file format uh, that you use to sort of understand where your application is and what resources it needs, using async API to uh, you know one file to <laughs> one file to rule them all, in the words of uh, of Lord of the Rings, uh, use use async API instead. So uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, I'll take a brief uh, interlude here uh, and run a demo of uh, IntelliJ code generation. Uh, it's powered by the open source community. It, it's under the covers calls the, the, the async API API, which I didn't even know it existed. And then we had a colleague find it and we're like, this is exactly what we need. It's unbelievable. And then we found it through Slack. So a uh, nice little example of community. Uh, I will say that the way that we find the async API is through uh, a Solace product called event portal. You'll notice that in the, in the demo, but like very well could be just, you know, you, you pick up the async API file off, off a hard drive. So just know that, but uh, I think the, the result is pretty cool. Async API, as you might guess, lets you define async interfaces. You can think of it as an open API for the event-based world. It's a relatively new standard, but it's gaining in popularity. You can create async APIs in development tooling, or products like Asapio can auto-generate them. 
regardless of where the async API comes from, the async API importer can suck them into event portal and make them findable and usable by other developers. So here's a simple example of an async API file. You can see it defines the application itself and also the events that come in and out of it. Now we'll head over to the importer. It's a CLI tool uh, that makes installation pretty easy. So we'll go ahead and install it. I should say that's because it's a command line tool, we'll run it as a command line, but it can also be used by additional tools like GitHub Actions or custom scripts. So we'll go ahead and initiate the command line here. Now we've got a report for our import here, and we'll move over into the event portal and see what we've got on the other side. We we'll refresh. The event portal organizes applications by domain, and we've specified a new new domain for this called Acme Retail Automation. We'll click into it, and the retail customer mobile application that we described using the async API is there for us to use. Clicking in, we can actually see the various different events that it uh, subscribes to. And if we dig further, we'll actually see the schema that's being used. Now let's update the async API and see that we can actually import uh, new versions of the async API if we want to. Let's say that we really want to have the product ID included in the uh, included in the async API description uh, that helps us be able to route things based on the product. So we'll add in the product to the async API, save it, and then we'll run the importer again. So now that the importer has completed, we'll go back to event portal, go back to our domain and take a look at the, the application that we had to find there. You can see now that we've got a, uh, a new version that reflects our updated topic strings for our event, and we're ready to go. So uh, coming back from that demo, uh, certainly it's not all rainbows. Uh, I think it would be appropriate because we're always a growing community, community to talk about the challenges associated with this particular approach. So uh, I think it's interesting that you know talking with Fran and Lucas and the rest of the guys about uh, about the growth towards uh, version three of the spec. Uh, as we start componentizing things uh, and, and promoting reuse, which I'm a, a big fan of, uh, we also run into the problem of shared resources. You know, both at runtime now and at more design time. Uh, and so I think that our approach at Solace at least is that rather than interacting directly with a pure async API, uh, the, the role of the async API catalog will come more into play. Uh, in other words, rather than somehow trying to figure out how things interact uh, using flat files, having something more uh, generic that allows those objects to relate in a more dynamic kind of way is gonna become more and more crucial. That's it, you know, uh, Solace is on that. Uh, Dave uh, has a fantastic uh, open source product called, uh, I believe it's called Event Catalog, IBM. I know he's looking into it, it sort of solutions like this as well. Uh, I think it's a really intriguing space uh, to, to think about. Um, and then that, in turn, also provides a really nice place to link back into that event API lifecycle that we talked about uh, to. To, uh, to, to begin with. In other words, this, the async API catalog creates a, you know, a, a little bit of a buffer mechanism by, between the, the raw async API that you don't, don't necessarily want all exposed out to your, to your uh, API consumers, uh, and also provides a level, level of government, governance there. Uh, and a very specific example of that is, you know, we have the, the ability to link in uh, server information in the in the async API. Um, it, that's certainly something you would want to have abstracted away from your if you're having external people interact with your through your application, but perhaps even internal people. Um, and the reason you would want to do that is 
as we all know, sort of the, the physical mapping of, of servers changes all the time. Uh, again, going back to, to Fran's sort of conception of late binding, you know, if we're late binding to a protocol, we're certainly want to late, late bind to a, uh, a particular server, physical server implementation. One of the challenges as we sort of have been thinking through our own uh, journey at Solace is that rather than having a physical uh, server def definition, it would be awful nice to have a logical server definition. In other words, this, uh, this application gets deployed to the red broker group. Um, in contrast, this you know, other application gets deployed to yellow. But in dev, red, red broker group is you know, a single broker because we don't want to spend a lot of money. But in production, it's you know, a, a highly available cluster that you know, will not be taken down regardless of, of <laughs> whatever happens. You know, the, uh, highly resilient uh, production broker. And being able to map that, not in the async API itself, you might have a little layer of abstraction, but something that you're using uh, behind the scenes perhaps to deploy your architecture, something like Terraform, something like Ansible, where there's a mapping between these logical uh, con concepts, logical broker groups, for example, and actual physical inventory of like, okay, this is the, the actual uh, broker that things land on. So with that said, uh, just another brief demo about uh, deploying out infrastructure. In this case, we uh, have an Ansible plugin actually that takes an async API and deploys that physical infrastructure uh, doing a crosswalk. Uh, you know, we sort of have hacked together our own little logical, uh, logical crosswalk, uh, logical into physical and then deploy out, in this case, uh, Solace infrastructure. Uh, obviously we're interacting with the, the Solace binding you can probably you can easily expand that out upon into MQTT or other other protocols as well. So, take a deep uh, a brief pause here uh, to run that demo, and we'll uh, see you when we get back. Your event-driven applications need to have things like queues, topics, and subscriptions to work. It would obviously be better if you generated those things automatically, and even better still if that auto auto generation used an open standard. That's what Ansible plugin for Event Portal does. It uses async API bindings, which are an open standard, so no weird proprietary stuff, to generate objects for a particular application. So we'll start off by checking out an async API file. You can see up here that we've got a number of different server definitions. But as we scroll down, you can also see that we have a queue binding, or rather a, a, a technology binding for Solace. Uh, there's technology bindings defined within async API, uh, for Solace, for Kafka, any number of different brokers. So we'll use this to drive our, uh, our creation process. So we'll use Postman to kick Jen Jenkins off, which we'll in turn call, call Ansible, which is a pretty common pattern. Uh, but just know that Ansible has a REST interface called Ansible Tower, so it's just a REST call. The REST call includes a path to an async API file, uh, which again, it contains a, a binding to either Kafka or Solace. Um, and it also tells it what environment to deploy in. So just to prove that there's no funny business going on here, we'll navigate over to the GUI. You can see that there's no, no queues right now, um, but we'll then we'll look back over at Jenkins and see we just are finishing up with Ansible Tower. And we'll move over into the GUI and see what we have here. Now we have the, the queue here. So I should say that Underneath the cover, uh, Ansible ho hosts playbooks, which you know they're sort of their their programming language, which can create underlying infrastructures for a wide variety of brokers. Um, it also hosts something called an inventory, which can map between a logical label like stores or warehouse to the actual brokers for an environment. So you can use the same Mason API file across multiple different environments. So in conclusion, uh, first of all, thank you. Uh, it was, it's an interesting for, topic for me to think about, and this is definitely a prompt to uh, think more deeply about it. Uh, and thank you actually to the, uh, the wider community, um, certainly in our efforts, uh, in my efforts, being able to leverage the great work of the open source community has been really, really helpful. And hopefully, you know, in things like the code generation, uh, we've been able to, to donate things back as well. We uh, and I finally, <laughs> this is you know, a work in progress. Uh, it's an intriguing topic for me, like I said, uh, but I'd really welcome feedback and, and <laughs> better understanding how 
these things work in your particular environments. So thank you and have a great day. All right. Um, so we are finally back. Um, you sound much better, Fran. Uh, yes. Please never use Restream with Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> Either Chrome or Brave or any other uh, similar browser. But uh, yeah, never Firefox. It's uh, I don't know why it sounds like like a robot. I don't know. Uh, so let me check with Sergio. Do we have any further questions? Let me check. No <laughs> question so far. No question. <laughs> <laughs> one, one person says great presentation. So I think that's all the feedback I need, frankly. Yeah. And thank you for your slides. And I'm sorry that I mispronounced your name. I think, and I have, I have a lot to apologize for. A, a I, I mispronounced your name. Two, uh, I stole your slides, although I gave you credit for it, so I think that, that doesn't really count. <laughs> okay. And three, I put the wrong demo in there. I really wanted to show the uh, the IntelliJ uh, demo because I think it's really amazing, and I think it actually really highlights the community effort. Like, we were developing this plugin. Obviously, we wanted to have it tie into our Solace uh, Async API catalog, but we also really wanted to have it streamline uh, code generation. We're like, oh, man, this is going to take forever. We're going to have to code it up. And then we hopped on Slack, people here at, at, at Solace, and we're, we asked, like, hey, this would be a great feature. If somebody should come, come along with this one day, like, you know, have a code generation API endpoint. And someone was like, yeah, that, that already exists. It's all automatically updated with all, like, you know, all the different generation options. We're like, holy cow, this is amazing. So that, like, you know, we got done in a day what we were plotting to do for, like, a week. So I think that really speaks to, uh, the strength of the community and the awesomeness that that can come out of uh, of an effort like this. So. Indeed, and uh, I would love to to add to what you just said about the community, right? Like, yeah, this year I'm uh, I'm now hosting this part of the conference, um, only this this uh, second half, let's say, of today. But um, the reality is that um, I could have done nothing today because there's a huge and great community behind it. And uh, actually, I'm not going to be uh, behind the event, not even Lucas, uh, tomorrow and, uh, and the day after, so in Saturday as well. So this really speaks uh, for itself. Like, uh, the community is truly driving this uh, effort. And it's, uh, like, coming up and saying, like, hey, I'm taking the ownership of this part. So, so yeah, this is, and this is really, really great, right? So, so yeah. Really cool. Definitely. Cool, folks. So if we don't have any further questions uh, or comments or, OK, no. Uh, so yeah, thanks uh, a lot, Jesse. See you around, as always, uh, in the community. And uh, have a good day. Sounds good. And I will actually post the real demo that I should have uh, <laughs> should have played during my presentation in the, uh, the conference uh, Slack channel. Um, okay. And I, Again, it's it's really cool and powered by community. So yeah, that's nice. that's really cool. Thanks, man. So see you all after Ow. the uh, yeah, bye bye. See you all after the break. Uh, I think we have like twenty minutes break or something like that. Um, just check the schedule, like I will do now. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, see you in a bit. Uh, let me show the. This. Oh, not this one.
Let me try to see it. Bueno, eso, que hasta las 8 está ahí, ¿no? Sí, pues hasta las 8. Veme para casa, hasta las 8 horitas. Yo sí, hasta las 8. ¿Cómo? aquí, ¿no? Me deja aquí tirado al asistente, me deja con todos los cables. Con todos los cables aquí, cabrón. Sí, es verdad, pues entonces mañana no tenemos que ver, no se preocupe. No, es especial, que luego. Eh, era para irme un rato para casa, hacer unas cosillas ahí, y luego para ir luego a trabajar y esas cosas, ¿no? No, 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 no. Hoy mi jefe me ha dicho de, de, de trabajar nada. <risa> trabajar y de hecho, hacer otras cosas. <risa> ya, de, de ir a comer el que va, o sea. <risa> Sí. Eh, eh, bueno, nada, eso, por eso te digo, que hago después o. Que, sí, claro, ¿no? Tío, vamos, sí, yo, por mí sí, por eso te yo decía. plan no tengo, o sea, yo la idea es que luego. Pues, yo, hay que tomar algo. De hecho, nuestra idea era que quedáramos luego. ¿no? Claro, por eso. Por eso o sea, digo que, bueno, como quedan dos horas todavía, ya, que acabes esto. Yo te dije antes, te dije que si, si quieres hacemos solo comida o solo de la tarde o las dos cosas. Me da igual, claro. Claro. O sea, que, así que ahí dentro no te volvemos a quedar, ¿no? Claro, por eso digo, si sí, sí. te quedas la pizza de los 10 minutos. Es que no se no, ha no, 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 esto puede ser una buena flipada. Con Postman, ¿sabes? Cuando salgamos, Postman Airlines. Cuando salgamos a bolsa, sí, bueno, si salimos a bolsa o algo de esto, lo que sea. Si salimos a bolsa. Si salimos a bolsa, me compro un avión. Salimos <risa> a bolsa y le dices dice a Postman que te, que te, que te ponga una, una banderola detrás del avión, ¿sabes? De, de este. Y la, y la pegatina de Postman y todo el avión. Y, y, así, y, el sí. dinero. y tú arriba ahí. Bueno, que aterrice y diga, y ahora me voy a marcar aquí un pull request. Toma. <risa> Those, are, Those are Postman Collection. <risa> two new open, uh, uh, open source. Con el, con el timón. Eh. I'm going to create two APIs. Meanwhile, I'm, driving, Meanwhile, I'm, I'm flying. I'm trying to land. I'm trying to land. <risa> Look how it is. How easy it is. <risa> kidding, but not kidding. Eh? No es imposible. No Now you say how to pronounce the name, eh? Juda. Ah,
<laughs> all right, all right. Let me just uh, check. Okay. Um, so don't worry for for those who are thinking that we're starting again. We're not starting again. Again, we're still on the on the break. But uh, we just had some funny moment here uh, where we left the mic open <laughs> during the. <laughs> During some time, and we're we're having some fun here. You guys may probably can join me here. Yeah. So, um, so we're having some fun here, and we were just, uh, you know, making jokes. And by petition of the community, uh, we're opening up this space for everyone to enjoy. Right. Uh, this was not intended to be like this. This is a break. This is a rip. So if no talks during this time <laughs> but why having a an image there when we can where we can have actually a a a casual let's say appearance here right so so yeah so some folks specifically federico moya which i oh, now wow. understand why he's uh, saying that we open the mic again because we were speaking spanish and it sounds like he speaks spanish <laughs> it sounds like my cousin but it's not but it's, huh? it's, it's my cousin Ah, sounds like you're causing it, yeah, <laughs> Moya as well, yeah. So, so yeah, um, we were just saying, what, 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 were we, what were we saying about the plane? Like, about ah, airplanes. Yeah. So, so Sergio is also also happens to be a. Um, a oh, well, you can explain yeah, in yourself. English, it's like light sport plane pilot. You have to move. Okay, okay I'm here. So, hi everyone. So I'm, I'm software developer right <laughs> but on my spare time when i have time that it's never or almost never i i am pilot of a small airplane right? ultra light no ultra i think it's called sport light sport planes it's like two seats planes mm -hmm. and we were talking about the possibility like so i work for, uh, for postman right um I, I, we were talking about do you imagine if postman can um, do some partner how, how we could uh sponsor yeah. spo a sponsor yeah, my, we're my... Saying like if we go if we go uh, at some point if we go public if postman goes public or something like that uh that we could ask Avinav, you know and, and you know the, the leadership of postman to to sponsor one of these <laughs> fly uh, one of these planes <laughs> yeah. with a long thing uh behind uh, how do you call that like this, yeah, kind of a flag or like a flag or something like that you know like um uh with the postman logo on the on the plane you know <laughs> and uh creating a, an api at the same time he's landing the the, the plane right like <laughs> look look how, how, look how it easy is. it is to create an api now with postman so yeah we were just having some fun here uh imagining that uh potential future <laughs> so it's, it's time for saying thanks to the and it's a, sponsor it's, it's, but it's recorded now so yeah if it if it happens at some point, we're gonna get we're gonna put this video somewhere again in the I, future. I mean, I mean, <laughs> I mean. So yeah, what do we have here? Um, oh yeah, so Federico is from Argentina. <laughs> He's saying that this is the best, uh, uh, the best uh, break so far, and he's only missing the beer. <laughs> uh, me too. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Akshad was looking for that uh i think we could do that i mean yeah like free people like whoever yeah. wants to join yeah and then and who that like we actually i actually noticed that we were uh live <laughs> because because who that called me and i couldn't hear him but i could hear myself <laughs> <laughs> and i was like uh what <laughs> why can't i hear me and yeah so that's how i noticed it was saying what if the uh, api fails <laughs> What if the <laughs> fails? What if the land fails? Yeah. <laughs> what what what's worse, right? Uh, obviously the API. Yes, right. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so yeah. <coughs> so this is the fun that we we could have uh, we could have in the next year on the in person conference, right? Uh, so we still have person there. Yeah, what next is happening? next we don't know yet. Like, okay. This is this is uh, yet to be decided. But I think it's happening in Barcelona, in the oh, end. Okay. But I don't know when, and uh, not even how. Like this is all Lucas working on that. So you better ask him. <laughs> Ace is laughing. <laughs> okay, yeah, just, yeah, okay. So so yeah. Uh, 
and um, yeah, this could be the actually the the, the fun that we could have together. No malicious, no malicious fun. Yeah, yeah. Just <laughs> just we just uh, having fun. Humble. And not and no alcohol as well as well. <laughs> I, I promise. That I water. promise. We can we could test. Water. Tap water, actually. Yeah, tap water. Well, that might be the reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tap water from, from Barcelona. Uh, that's, that's like a drag. Yeah. Or, or even worse. <laughs> so, 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 yeah. <coughs> what? Are no. we still on time? Uh, I don't want to eat anyone's time. Not yet. Uh, this is starting at 45, right? Oh, we still have like 30 minutes. Yeah. Oh, damn it. Should we? Uh, this. Uh... <laughs> Federico say like, nice excuse to visit Barcelona. Uh, I hope it's the delay and you don't mean that the, the nice excuse is the what tap water. Right? <laughs> I think you mean that <laughs> the in person conference. I, I hope so. Uh, Akshat, I firstly, you all were in online meeting. Uh, having fun with each other, but it's great to meet each other and have such meeting conference. I agree. Yeah, and Karuna says, I agree with that chat. Yeah, that would be amazing. And that's what we want to do next year, right? That's what we wanted to do this year, but it is harder than we thought. So, so yeah, we're just going to do it next time. Um, we already started, actually, which is something that we didn't do in this uh, edition of the conference, right? Um, we should have started probably organizing before. And uh, yeah, things that uh, are like normal things that you realize after uh, they happen, right? Not before, but yeah. yeah. The, the other was more like, you, yeah. you're talking about the, why we didn't do it. Yeah, why we didn't do it, yeah. It was a, a venue. It was a venue problem. We yeah, couldn't yeah. find a venue on time to... So that it. time, yeah, and then it happened sponsors. to be a lot of a lot of conference at the same time yeah. or, or things like that. And we didn't have also much time to, for sponsors to, to tell them in advance. And online is fine. It's almost, I would say, like free, if not free completely. So, um, but in person costs uh, a lot of money, so we need sponsors. Right. So, so yeah, we need to give time to sponsors to 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 join the effort, right? Is this an hey, official call for sponsor? Ah, uh, yeah, and this is <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Ace is saying uh, break without the beer. Come on, <laughs> <laughs> who wants to go for the beers? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. We're gonna wait until the end of the uh, the conference. We're gonna respect each time, each of you time, right? You can start having beers if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not you, Ace. You're still working. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, the rest uh, of the people watching, please okay. do it. <laughs> Have a beer for us. We we're gonna stay quiet now. <laughs> <laughs> we we can practice the silence. Okay. And look at the camera. Let's try some meditation. Yeah, let's try meditation. meditation. Yeah, let's try meditation. Yes. Oh, oh, oh. This is something. We don't have chairs here. here. It's like I do. <laughs> and you have also. You can see how it works everything. Yeah. 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 Hey, I have a feel like that. <laughs> Actually, this is a nice, uh, I was saying, like uh, practicing the silence is a nice trick for um, presentations in conferences when you're on stage. And some people are afraid of staying in silence for more than half a second or one second because <laughs> it's like ah, I need to start speaking again. <laughs> right. That's right. I need to feel this silence. Uh, so yeah, if you can practice this, and I'm gonna do it now. Face the silence. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you broke the silence. <laughs> you oh, pay yes. the beers. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> we should have backstage comedy for every break. <laughs> I'm not sure this qualifies as comedy. <laughs> this is too sad to be comedy. Uh, can you tell the story of how the SNTPA initiative started? <laughs> and then, and sorry, and I was reading A's and I'm like, what's, what's that behind you guys? Twitter. Uh, that is, yeah, that is. <laughs> that thing is Peter. That thing is Peter, yeah. <laughs> and this is a window in case you're wondering. <laughs> so, do you wanna, do you really wanna listen to the reason why Async KPI started? Like, yes. or, is, or is it too boring for a break? <laughs> Don't, I mean, we can try again with the silence. We can try. <laughs> yeah, you broke the silence. <laughs> uh, I mean, in short, was uh, I was uh, in the need to document event-driven architecture, right? Um, that's it. Basically, I, I wanted to document my event driven architectures. I was using Open API. I could document REST APIs, um, but um, but yeah, there was nothing. So, so I copied, forked with actually not GitHub fork, but I forked um, Open API and started modifying from top to bottom just to um, just to make it work for my case and. Um, yeah, it went out of hands apparently. Right? <laughs> like that's the that's the short story, right? Um, now I kept talking about it in co uh, in conferences, and then at some point, um, it got inter interest from other people that were in the same situation as myself, and then more and then more, and then yeah, and here we are, right? Like uh, this is the this was the reason. Uh, why isn't KPI was created? And you see, it's boring. <laughs> Everyone is, is quitting now. I'm sorry. I'm joking. So, so Ace wanted to scare us, but yeah, it didn't work. Probably in person, it will work better. Ave <laughs> Satan. Uh, this is who's who's saying Ave Satan? <laughs> yes. Why? <laughs> If you want to broke the silence, you can invite Lucas. Uh, yes, and Ace is saying great uh, artist copies. Yeah. No, that what yeah. was the what was the sentence like? Great artist copy and uh, I don't know, awesome artists or something like that. Uh, Steel, right? I think that was from. I don't know how much from I can't remember who said that. Yeah. We, we have a light. It's a, it's a, it's a, yeah. a, yeah. it's, a <laughs> it's a, it's a little bit like it's Halloween. The, the worst, worst, like, worst kind of light you can have for yes. I can Your face is not clean at all. Maybe. <laughs> like that. Yeah, that's even scary. So probably we can tweak the we can tweak the camera a little bit. By doing Some something. cameras can put. Uh, Let's do this. Mm. It's going to be a little bit darker, but <laughs> a little bit. But <clears throat> that's going to probably mm. uh, make the light of the screen maximum. Luckily, you didn't turn on off the lights when you were talking about the story of Asian right? <laughs> because I was close mm -hmm. to the bed. On. <laughs> <laughs> Just trying to. Fun. I don't know if this is working. I'm gonna check now. Uh, yeah, it goes with a lot of delay there. Oh, well, it introduces a little bit of noise, but at least it's a little bit more realistic. <laughs> right? Yeah, it is like yeah. you can see your yeah. face. I don't know. More cozy. Maybe. We I, can... I, I look at that. We can see Peter, can see Peter without right? being there. Yeah. No, no. Yeah. I, 
look at this in the window. Ah, yeah, exactly. Ah, míralo. Oh, not anymore. Oh, again. Ahora. Here. Oh, we can see. <laughs> we, can, we can even see from there. <laughs> No, 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 we're still live. Um, and uh, Karuna is saying, now imagine lights go out and we see a shadow lurking. <laughs> 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 then we've, we've got the Halloween show. And still jokes coming from it. Yeah, that would be confusing. <laughs> and people laughing this as saying. <laughs> we can do probably a Halloween show or something with this light. What the screen is like? Uh, yes, that, that's probably also helpful. That is, yeah, we should be able to increase it, but. Is it maximum? Yeah, maybe. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. El Gato Productions. Oh, El Gato Productions. That's. <laughs> Who needs likes when you have screens? Yeah. <laughs> right. Sometimes I need to Okay. So put it as it was before. Oh, fuck. It's too much. Sorry for it. <laughs> okay. Now it's, it's blinking. But that is because of this. Yeah. Oh, it introduces a bit of noise. But yeah, it's, fine. it's, it's okay. Fine. It's okay. <laughs> so Ace, Ace is, uh, I can see Ace um, laughing a lot. Man, you have permissions to, to join Restream. So, I mean, I cannot be inviting everyone to Restream here, but you can do it. So, it's about time that you join us. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you guys acting <laughs> like you just seen light for the first time? Wait, we have a, we have a we have also uh, Karuna quoting me like, "Who needs light when you have screens?" Fran at AsyncKBI Conf. <laughs> no matter how much time you spend trying to create something meaningful like AsyncKPI. You say one sentence and, and that is what will last forever. <laughs> Let's do a t-shirt with that sentence. Oh, yeah, we can do a t-shirt. Yeah, yeah. That's a good idea. <laughs> I can quote, uh, I can quote Karuna and say like, um, put the same sentence and then quote like Karuna says that, said that. Yeah. <laughs> so that, um, the t-shirt could be a quote of, of a quote. <laughs> recursive. Uh, yeah. Recursive. Now we can say like um, definition of recursion, something like that. You <laughs> Taylor, well, actually, it's not recursive. <laughs> Ace is saying, I don't want to troll you false life. Uh, I'm just saying that you have the permissions to do it, to, to join. So, I mean, the, not my permission. You don't need my permission. You have the restream access. So, just say it. And we still have like 20 minutes. Give a man a mask and you'll hear the truth. That's another good t shirt. Which one? A little bit? Give a man. A mask, mm -hmm. and you'll hear the truth. Mm -hmm. Which one? Mm -hmm. Okay, now we have two t-shirts. Now we have two t-shirts. <laughs> <laughs> you left me alone here on camera. Mm -hmm. I can see. Right. <laughs> and you feel the pressure? <laughs> no, no, I don't feel the pressure. Yeah. I'm already yeah, used to. It. Yeah. I'm already used to it. But yeah. let's still, let's still. Right. Can I still? Ah, you are. Ah. 
<laughs> I'm trying to park. I'm but, trying to pay but, the parking. But tell, tell people actually. <laughs> what you but say? Why? What's happening? Okay, I'm trying to pay um, parking of my car because I came my car as a not a responsible people <laughs> this time because I had to use it for coming here. You know, things life. Um, and I'm trying to hack the application because for doing that, you need to be on the place with the GPS, right? Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm trying to use taking position. fake GPS position for <laughs> able to pay a, a bit more of what I pay. So that's what I'm doing. I, but, I hope, but you can go down, right? Like for, for a yeah, but, I mean, uh, you're, but I'm, I'm like a good colleague. I, I don't want to leave you here alone. Okay, okay. Alone, yeah. Alone, I mean, with, oh, <laughs> along, yeah. along with along. Peter and, <laughs> along with Peter and uh, along. and Agma, right? And Jovi. Okay. <laughs> Jovi. Okay. Is Hodarito working or is he in bed? Oh, damn it. Ace, you brought it. <laughs> oh, yeah. No yeah, my, it's my birthday tomorrow. So, so yeah, you won't see me live tomorrow. <laughs> is, it, is it tomorrow? Tomorrow. Oh, oh good friends. I, ah, okay. I, I knew. I knew. Now I get yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> you see, ha have friends just for that. <laughs> so, they, so they learn about your birthday the, the day before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, in his favor, I must say that every time we were celebrating my birthday, we were under some circumstances, let's say. <laughs> Are we going to celebrate it like this only? I mean, not me. <laughs> I'm going to celebrate it a little more, a little bit more. Uh, that's why I'm not coming live. Maybe I can, I can just like to say hello on the chat, <laughs> of course, not live. <laughs> but tomorrow I'll be partying. Uh, the kind of party that you have when you have a kid, of course, <laughs> which is no party. <laughs> yeah, it's just like probably going out and ordering uh, food, ordering food, <laughs> and you know, like not drinking alcohol because you, you with your kid, right? So, so yeah, that kind of party. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> actually made a good point. Like, yeah, just be live for some more time and it will be 12 a.m. in India. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that we can wish you. Um, yes, uh, I mean, I appreciate when I wasn't born in India. <laughs> so it doesn't really make the trick, right? <laughs> but yeah, yeah, that would be cool. Yeah, I mean, I'm somewhere in the world. It's already, it's already my birthday, right? So, so yeah. If someone beyond India <laughs> is there, probably they can confirm. Uh, and David, thanks for the happy birthday. Um, thankful. I'll try to enjoy as much as, as we can here. And yeah, it will have been really cool to celebrate my, my birthday here in, a, in an in-person conference as, as it was supposed to be. <laughs> that will have been really cool. And that's why I chose when I was voting for the for the dates of the conference. I was like, "Yes, you're my birthday," so we can plan a good a good party. <laughs> Ace is saying, "I need to dedicate a meme for you tomorrow." <laughs> Ace. <laughs> We can probably cut this this video like ace. <laughs> and repeat. It's probably going to be needed at some point. Now I'm now I'm reading a message saying, "Yo, Sergio, you folks are not muted. You are not muted." Ah, so we had no, no, no from. Now I'm reading. Ah, okay, 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 okay. You're not muted. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, thanks for that. For that, like, we noticed because of your call. <laughs> yeah. 
Bang banyak sudah. Banyak can confirm that um, I and she as well and like we have a, we have a magnet for these situations and this you know and, uh, like Eva and I used to say that uh, we have a magnet for weird people to to come to us and become our friends I don't know why ah nice so so, so yeah I'm not calling you weird people <laughs> even though you are but <laughs> but it was like the kind of weird like I don't know like people super drunk and living in the streets and and uh and for some reason they were always coming to us and talking to us so and, and we were always enjoying the kind of stories that they they wanted to to tell us but yeah and i know that barbanya also has this this magnet <laughs> barbanya if you're in the chat you have to say hello now you have to confirm my story so Huda, Huda. I learned today that it's not Huda, it's Huda. So you should have told me Huda, Huda. <laughs> so the caption of the meme uh, can be when you forget to turn off your mic, picture a friend. <laughs> you should be live in the stream right now so that we could have heard this words in real. Uh, yes yes it would have been cool that uh, ace will have joined the live stream and say hey what the fuck are you doing man <laughs> you're live <laughs> but i support this meme idea like um like this like um or maybe um uh, our pictures probably not just mine right yeah. and um in a plane with postman logo right? <laughs> when you forget to <laughs> to turn off the mic <laughs> something like that that would be nice people will understand but only some people i'm, I'm happy as well to speak if you not here yeah it was a joke, but I would be happy to be like under the sponsorship of any company that wants to be a sponsor for a plane. You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> any company, say <laughs> you. Uh, we have to check if this is uh, legal by your contract. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's, any that's... kind of engagement with other companies? <laughs> it would be an engagement. It's out of okay. <laughs> Probably not legal. You check the pilot license. Yeah, <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> I mean, it's expensive to fly. Uh, so Karuna is saying, imagine this amazing moment not existing just because they turn their mic off without forgetting. <laughs> Way too many negations there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't fully get. Yeah, uh, imagine that if we didn't do like if we this, do, yes, yeah. we would not have this. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. 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 That, that's what I was thinking, but I was like, I'm not sure. I'm really I don't know how to name this. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was about to leave, you know. Yeah, you were about to leave, exactly. <laughs> yeah, same and, and 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 we were all worried here, like, oh, what what were we speaking about, like. It was recorded. We have to mm, take it off of the recording, and I was like, "No, why? Let's just <laughs> let's just go live and, and transparently show what we were talking about." Uh, of course, <laughs> and then uh, and then Axet is saying, um, "Should we call designers uh, to the stream for uh, for the meme to this? Go for it. Design the meme." <laughs> Now till you get we get fired. <laughs> <laughs> we get you fired. Now till we get you fired. <laughs> to Ace. So Ace Ace is saying that uh, you should guys uh back off. Yeah. <laughs> and I need to inform YouTube to block you. <laughs> uh 
Okay, let me check what time is it. Oh, we're still on, on schedule, I think so, right? Um, so yeah, it's at 45. So Daniel will be joining soon. Okay. All right, Ace, I think it's your time, man. It's time for you to join. <laughs> no pressure. It shows the opportunity. <laughs> join this great community. <laughs> oh, yeah. Correct. Greg, the great Greg Meldrum. What is it? You can start with the. Can we use it? Can we use it? Uh, Greg oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we, we can play it. Do you have it there? I don't know. Right, you can, uh, it, you can probably find it on the. Um, it was the movies, books, and music uh, channel, which is now oh, how to contribute. Maybe, <laughs> maybe <laughs> yes. I don't know. Uh, it was another channel. Like I can so certainly remember. You know that from Sandra, that dancer. Yes. Really? Yes. 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 Was that for champion? <laughs> <laughs> really? Sponsors. <laughs> Thank you, said More sponsors. Ah, uh, sponsors, no? Uh, no, I'm kidding. Ah, more sponsors, no? Greg Medroom. Do you still practice or is it was... No, 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 I'm doing handstand only yeah. now, so yeah. Are we getting a jingle for Ace and KPI? We already have, Karuna. We already have a jingle for Ace and KPI. It, the great no, Greg no, Meldrum uh, created one last year for us. Um, and... Um, I don't think it was finished, he, or he said like he wanted to give a uh, final touches, but it's really cool. Um, can't remember where is it. Uh, yes, there you go. Is it Sonia? I'm good with my EDA, but how do I describe the way the fans flow through the system? Keep them apps pushing the pistons. I try acing KPI, channel skills all the line. Do it with Jet in the studio, and it's looking mighty fine. But wait, which direction do they go? Is it published or so it's kind? This is an exciting opportunity to join this great community. <laughs> ACKPI. <laughs> 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 Share it on the on some channel on Slack because in the conference. Yeah. <laughs> so you see, uh <laughs> so Karuna is saying like I'm clipping this and sharing on Twitter. <laughs> I hope please do it. Like um I need Sergio and Pedro to show some dance move. <laughs> Ace, you are the, the Frank is the break dancer. No. <laughs> I'm not anymore. 
Uh, folks, we're about to continue um, with the conference. So let's slow down a little bit because otherwise it's going to be um, really bad for Daniel. <laughs> So yeah, uh, the song, by the way, the song was um, created and I mean, like done completely by Greg Meldrum from Solace. And the async API chorus, chorus is um, a few of us, like I think it's Sergio, it's Greg, it's me, it's me twice actually, <laughs> different two different versions. <laughs> I recorded two and so he picks one and he picked, and he, uh, picked two. So yeah, and, uh, and Probably some people because I don't know. He he should know better the list of people. All of us uh, singing uh, async KPI, you know this chorus. So that is really cool. It was supposed to be a collaborative song, so the people can add more uh, lyrics to the song and so on. But we didn't continue. We should probably ping uh, Greg to to actually do something cool with the song and like officially launch it if. Whatever officially means here, right? <laughs> Whatever officially means in the open source. So, so yeah. Um, okay, backing up a little bit. Next talk is from Daniel Cocot from CodeCentric. And it's uh, adopting async API in enterprise contexts. So, um, just gonna wait. A f well, I'm gonna wait uh, one more minute because uh, it's not yet the time. But yeah, so Daniel, if you're around and want to say hi, please join or or we can chat after the the talk as well. <coughs> and yeah, so I hope you enjoyed this break. It was completely improvised, as you can imagine, <laughs> and the result says so. <laughs> so, so yeah, it wasn't. Uh, I wasn't expecting this. I actually liked it. It was well. We, we should probably do it every year, um, like a yeah. random one. Like yeah. random one. Yeah, like, random one will be surprise. one of those kinds. You have to stay. You have to stay to to, to, to not to lose it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, folks. So now this time, I I hope that we don't <laughs> keep the mic open by mistake, and um, yeah. So Daniel Cocot, um, adopting async API in enterprise context. There we go. Hi, hi. Welcome to my talk about adopting async API in enterprise context. So as you see, we move moving into the enterprise. My name is Daniel Cocot. and I'm working for CodeCentric in uh, Germany as a head of API experience and operations. And also I'm a senior solution architect there. If you'd like to contact me, just use the email address spotted there or go to Twitter or go to LinkedIn, what you ever like. So you can find me there. You find maybe a lot of things about what I'm doing there and maybe we get in contact. But first, challenges of enterprise. So when we are working with enterprise companies, we see a lot of challenges actually not only in regards to APIs or anything like that. So it's it's really more about there's a lot of things moving on. So we have a lot of complexity there. So very complex systems, normally something like SAP involved or any other systems around. So there's a lot of things around. There are a lot of tools actually there. So every team uses his own tools. So we are missing a lot what we might be needing for having and the teams actually have a lot of ideas. But these ideas are totally different to things on persons you find normally in the enterprise. So when you look at an, in, at an enterprise in an IT department, you always find these enterprise architects there. So they have their own view on things and things they will, and they think they will always write what they do. So they don't really trigger the needs a team has, they're always just focusing on what is the status and how to keep the status available. So there is no real innovation or something like that. So we're really moving into things that we need to, to really move on. And every team, all the teams there are looking for 
yeah, some kind of solutions. So they want to get faster, actually. They want to have the opportunity to, to really move on, to, to learn or, or to do the things, actually, that are all proven by others so that we really can think about and say, okay, yeah, this is what we really like to do, but not the really old stuff, maybe in some kind of legacy part. So in this case, legacy is nothing really ugly or something like that. So it's really thinking about the stuff that already is existing there. So doing things with the existing yeah, systems around actually. So really focusing on solutions. And normally when teams think about solutions, they always have APIs in mind. So they really think about, oh, this is like some kind of puzzle pieces. Or when you look at Gardner and uh, any other um, technology analysts in the market, they always talk about something like composable enterprise and anything like that. So they really have puzzle pieces, as I said, to put together and make things available. So this is the, this is the trick behind doing, doing things or what the team is really like to achieve in the end. And sometimes it happens that people misunderstand or have a, have a misunderstanding actually of what is an API. I, I learned a lot of um, things from talking to enterprises uh, here in Germany and there was always this quote, everything is an API. So a lot of people were thinking, okay, everything must be an API, which is not quite incorrect actually, to be honest, but it's, yeah, somehow hard to, to, to say something like that because when it comes to the upper level, so when we're getting more on the C-level side, when there are something pops up like everything is an API, people are some, somehow concerned about this because sometimes there is no need for an API because we're just delivering services in the field of, of integration or stuff like that. So there is no API available, there's just a service running. But this is something to really reconsider. And you can think about this when you have a deeper look into things of governance. Yeah, you have to be very hard in governance and very quick and moving on into towards the things that call, what, what we have in, in, in yeah, API governance or service governance and all the things that are that are actually around to, to really think about it and make sure that every team understands what is the standard the organization would be, would be like f to follow, actually. And then you have the possibility to really evolve something really, really big. Because in the end, when you think about APIs, when you think about solutions, you have to be very fast. You can't say, oh, yeah, we delivered this in three months or so. So it's a really short time to market. So you really have to be aware of what is happening there. So you need a lot of governance actually to to really make sure that people do the things right as you already talked about with them actually. So it's really something you have to achieve to, to really move on and to really think about what is what is really needed actually in this in this case. And for that you again need a lot of tools actually. So there is nothing that you just buy a one size fits all solution. You could do that. But it's not really helpful, actually, because when we when we talk about this, we, we are here at the Async API conference, actually. So we have a different type of APIs. So this is something where we have to think about. So there are a lot of yeah API interaction patterns, as I always talk about this. And there is a lot of tools needed, actually, to, to really involve this, this API package as a whole, actually. So the thing is, when we think about, again, and the, the solution part, the teams, what they would like to achieve is really adapting APIs. But the thing is, how can they really do this? What do they need for and what is, what is the purpose they would like to achieve in the end? So just saying, yeah, we need APIs. Yeah, for what? What would you like to achieve in the end? So this is really the, the, the thing about the purpose. So you really have to think about I need something to enable the teams to really think about APIs. And it's really a good start to think about this, this API enablement to, to have some kind of framework for this or, or process or something to really make sure that the people follow these, I wouldn't say guidelines, I wouldn't say, also wouldn't say process, 
that they really follow steps to really engage over time, to really bring value to the company. Because in the end, these APIs should stay forever, but they will, will evolve over time. So there will be changes. We, we can really think about so there will be also breaking changes yeah everybody's aware of this oh there well there shouldn't be breaking changes but there will be because sometimes we don't take the right decision at the right time this is quite normal and in the end forcing teams to really think about this api enablement in this enterprisey context is really good because in the end it's all about yeah documentation and normally when you when you when you think about APIs in enterprise context, it's always about RESTful. Now, RESTful is at the beginning. Everyone, everybody wants to have a documentation of what is available as RESTful APIs, but nobody really talks about RESTful APIs. In this case, they're saying, ah, oh, we, we have APIs here. So it's really starting with, with the RESTful stuff. Over time, there is something happening because there's a lot of technologies around. We, I talked about that earlier, actually. So at some point, somebody pops up and says, oh, we have also events and messages. And normally then something happened that somebody says, yeah, I read a blog post or something about that. So I, I read about that Async API is the rescue for it. So everybody wants to use Async API to yeah, whatever, describe things in regards to this uh, asynchronous conversation stuff, actually. So everybody is so, oh, this is, this is, this is the, the holy grail. We have to use it. But when, when you talk to the people directly, no one really understands from the beginning what, what, what it means, actually. For, for a lot of people, it's just another description, standardization or whatever. But... When they look deeper into this, they see, oh, shit, it's a little bit different what we see from the open API side. So we, we have to think about more that we need more knowledge on, on knowledge on the back end, actually. So it's, it's not about just having things done with open API. Yeah, it's easy to start with Async API, but, but having this context and normally you have this department type of style when you when you talk with enterprises you always have to get them all with this api enablement to 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 really make sure that they follow all the guidelines an api enablement team puts up actually so this api enablement team is to be always on top of them actually so when we when you think about when we see this async api stuff and see that we need more knowledge on the backend technology. It's a totally different approach what we have with Open API actually. With Open API, we just write about a contract or describe a contract between a provider and a consumer on the other side actually. So they both know each other's other, but the provider doesn't want that the consumer does have any knowledge about what is happening in his backends actually. So he's just providing this contract as a whole. So he's always talking about the contract with the, with the consumer and saying, ah, this is the contract you have actually. And this is what, what I provide to you. You can use it. Does it fit to your needs or do you need something different? And in the end, having this APIs, which, which are just vehicles actually to transfer, transport actually or transfer um, some kind of data stuff. It's really something you, you really have to think about. Because when you now describe things where you need a lot of knowledge of the backend technology, it's really hard for people doing this API enablement or being enabled to use APIs to really understand the difference at first sight. So it's really something you have to move very slowly, very slowly forward, actually, to, to make sure that everybody understands. So in the end, when you think about to, to, yeah, to describe things or to describe your architecture with Async API, it's a totally different approach because you have to, know, to, to, to gain knowledge about the backend technology. So in the end, 
when you force the teams or would like to, to have the teams describing their topics or whatever you have when, when you use Kafka or when you use MQTT or something like that, you have to specify design principles and also libraries to cover the needs. And this is really something which, which is a really step forward because in regards to open API, you can always yeah, specify design principles. You should do that, but you don't need libraries. These libraries will come up over time because a lot of teams do the same things. Or you have some kind of error codes or something like that that you would like to provide in a library actually, but you are not needed to. In this case, you, you, you have to actually have these libraries because there will be people that just use the technology to provide events and messages, but they don't have any insights about what does the technology really do or what it's consisting of actually. So they don't have any ideas about a Kafka cluster or anything like that. So they're just using the things. And in this case, it's really needed to think totally different and say, okay, before we do, before we really do that, we have to really specify things and we have to deliver libraries in this case really design libraries saying okay this is what you need you just can reference to it which is possible within the uh, within the async api uh, specification so far so and this leads again to another step to be honest maybe to automate things in the end to really to really rethink what we what we done because normally it would be better to have something like code first so there are some code first type of uh, type of uh, tools available actually for the uh, for the async api stuff but that might be not the needs for an enterprise because the enterprise is not thinking in having spring boot having C sharp or anything like that. They just need an overall thing type of thing. So this is what, what I'm really thinking about when I talk to um to, to and to enterprises actually to really we need an automation that that is slightly code first, but not really code first actually. But it's something that is not API first in this case, because API first would only work with the people who really administrate or do the operational stuff with uh, with the um, yeah with the components in regards to synchronous APIs actually, and this is really what something what what really comes to to my mind when I when I really think about this is this is actually my opinion. So when when I think about what might become next, this is just an idea what what I have in mind actually. It's not that there is something is still existing or that there is something that you should do or anything that's it's just my opinion actually to be honest and for me it's it's really something to to really think about that there must be a need to to really use tools that that really admire this this library this principle stuff to really make sure that people can do these api definitions in an easy way they should not hinder them to really uh, think about what is needed and, and what, what they need. They, they should support the things they, they would like to achieve in the end. This is really what must happen to, 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 bring, to bring value to the whole topic, actually. Not to say, oh, this is another specification. Oh, we have another technology. This is what you should use and uh, how your message should like. And it's really thinking about what is what is needed on the developer side to really also understand what I am I using there when I have to describe the the, the, the topic that I provide to, to, to other consumers actually and, and that they could use this and that we have value within the company to, to really present data with with this topic and so on and so on. So it's it's really thinking about as a whole, not to just saying, oh, yeah, we do we do open API, now we do async API. The next step is we do something totally different, like GraphQL and all the stuff to really think about what, what is the what is the purpose and what, what is the value? 
we achieve by creating async API specifications or definitions in, in this case. Just what, what is the purpose for, 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 for the company and what is the purpose for, for the users to see what is available. And, and this is something we, we really have to think about. For all this, we need a specification. There's, there's no thing that we can really dis discuss about. We need a specification to be more sufficient in describing asynchronous APIs. There, there, is, there is no need to, to discuss this or, or, already. Or in any case, it's really about more thinking about how to adapt the possibilities I have. And this is, in somehow my closing words, with, with this uh, short presentation, I should be honest, I ha would have more time actually, but I, w I wouldn't stress it too hard because it's, it's quite, quite late actually. And this is what I leave for now. It's more something to, to really rethink of and maybe we can start a discussion about it. So wrapping this up, you find a lot of information by using just the link tree you, you see here in the, uh, in the slide deck. And if you like, you can contact me via Twitter or LinkedIn. And we have a purely full discussion about what I, what I actually talked about. It's just my own idea of things that could happen in some ways. Thank you for listening to my talk and uh, enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. All right. So <coughs> we finished uh, Daniel's uh, presentation. So I got a message from Daniel uh, during the presentation, now during the where, while we were playing the recording, and um, he actually was doing a uh, a workshop today, and he lost uh, his voice. So so yeah, he, unfortunately he cannot join. And uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, I'm gonna check. Uh, let me check because I'm, I'm alone now, <laughs> by the way. So I'm going to check on the conference channel to see if there are any questions. Um, sounds like not. Okay. So, yeah, um, a reminder, as a reminder that um, you can have, you can leave any questions on the chat or uh, on Slack on our conference 2022 channel. And um, we'll be happy to reply them as um, um, as much as we can, of course. In this case, uh, Daniel cannot be here to answer questions, but I will try if I can. And if not, Daniel will be able to see the question in Slack um, later. So, okay, let me check the schedule. All right. All right. So we have like 25 minutes break, more or less. And uh, then we have my onboarding experience as a new docs contributor to async API. We'll have uh, Anisad Akimbani, um, and uh, we'll be speaking. We'll be presenting uh, their experience as a as a new docs contributor, right? So uh, before I move forward, I'm going to keep having a look at uh, Slack, searching for questions. And remember that you, you can ask whatever you want. And we'll reply whatever we want <laughs> as well. And yeah. So, yeah. So Daniel is saying thanks, by the way, to all of you for watching. <laughs> um, keep monitoring. So we have, um, we'll have like about 25 minutes break. What kind of, <laughs> what kind of break do you want us to do? <laughs> That's the question. Real break? Or, <laughs> or a break like the one before. So I see Karuna is saying, like, meanwhile, we've seen the jingle. We can. 
actually, let me try to find it on on Slack, and I'll share it on the conference channel. If Sergio didn't do it yet, because I'm not sure if he did it. Ah, he did. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's on the conference 2022 channel. So Sergio uh, shared the SNKBI Anthem version three, right? By Greg Meldrum from Solas. So yeah, really cool. Greg, if you're listening, we should be we should be um, finishing this and promoting it further. This is a really cool one. I love it. We can we can probably now have more people recording their voices voices, and yeah, that will be amazing. Okay. All right. How are you folks and you in the conference so far? I haven't been on the first half of the day. I was flying to Barcelona, but how has it been? I see you're enjoying so far. I see a lot of a lot of people connected today. Damn, chat stream is low. It's really delayed. All right, so not waiting any further. Let's do a real break and uh, see you in 20 minutes. <laughs> so Karuna, I think it's time to, <laughs> to take a real break. Your mom will thank you. <laughs> All right, see you in 20 minutes, bye-bye.
All right, so we're back live again. This time is for um, the last uh, talk of the day. And um, yeah, I just want to make a quick check. Are you folks still there? You still up to watch a one more great presentation? I would love to learn from you from the chat if you're around. So um, the next talk is uh, actually one of the kind of talks that I like the most because it's not talking specifically about async API, um, you know, the technology itself, but it's speaking more about the community and uh, this vibrant community because it's really becoming, it, it is really vibrant and it's really, it is really great. And um, and it's more about you know like how the experience uh, in this case from Andy said um, joining the community and learning and contributing right so so yeah looking forward to this talk actually really really looking forward and actually really looking forward for more kind of these talks or for more uh, more of this uh, if not talks uh, you know people talking about it in casual chats. Um, this is really what what makes it uh really cool to be part of a uh of a community right uh too many reallys i just realized <laughs> so um so yeah next talk is my onboarding experience as a new docs contributor to async api from anisat akin akin bunny um not sure if she will be able to join after the talk for questions if Anisat, if you're around, please do let me know. And um, yeah, and you're welcome to join uh, whenever you want, of course. So let me check once again. All right. So yeah, as I said, this this is gonna be the last. Uh, talk of the day we had a um, really long day of talks I'm sure that for you folks who have been um, around for the whole day you must be tired I realize about it so so yeah um, I hope you enjoyed the, this last one after this talk I'll just um, say a few words just some closing remarks that nothing really long I don't want you to to stay here for any longer go and get some rest right so so yeah and then it's over um we have two more days we have uh, tomorrow and saturday as well so you know friday and saturday so yeah i will not be around um uh, luckily <laughs> luckily for you i mean <laughs> and um that sounded really bad um but yeah um um, that that is actually one of the cool things, right? That um, this is a community effort, and we're just uh, I'm just one more of the community. So, yep. Let's wait for a few more uh, seconds, one more minute, and uh, I'll play the the recording. My onboarding experience as a new docs contributor to Async API by Aniset Akimbani. Enjoy. Hello, and welcome to Async API Conference 2022. My name is Anissa Akimbani, and I will be talking about my homeboarding experience as a new docs contributor to Async API. So who is Anissa? Anissa is a front-end engineer, a technical writer, and an open source contributor. Um, I basically transitioned into the world of technology about yeah, two years ago, like right after my a year after my graduation. So um, I picked interest in the aspect of front-end development and I, you know, developed my skill along that line, um, picking up new technologies learning you know studying industrial chemistry in school and then doing something entirely different from what you studied in school 
So um, the learning curve was, was very steep at the beginning, like it was really slow at the beginning, but yeah, yeah, we are. Um, along the line, I also picked um, technical writing and uh, as well as open source contribution. Um, if I'm not coding or writing technical articles or probably contributing to open source, I basically take works to the beach or just works in general, be by myself or with my family or friends. Yeah, that's that's it. And a bit fun, uh, fun fact about myself is I love fries. I'm a big fan of fries, potato fries, Irish fries, whatever. So that's just a bit about Anissa. Um, now, before I go right into the talk itself, I just want to give a quick backstory about my open source journey. Um, I first, I first learned about the word open source from a very popular open source community um, event, which is Oscar. And yeah, the full, the full meaning is Open Source Community Africa. It's a very popular open source conference that holds in Lagos, Nigeria. And that was like, I attended that conference around the, about the time I, I kick-started my tech career. So I attended with a whole lot of enthusiasm because as a techie, you know, when you're, especially when you're just, even, even when you're not just starting your career, like as a techie in general, this, there's this whole excitement about, you know, going to conferences because you see, pe most people see it as an opportunity to like learn, grow, network, meet new people and all of that. So yes, like I said, I attended this conference with great enthusiasm and um, I learned a lot of things. I jotted out so many things and gathered a whole lot of tips on open source and um, what have you, because the conference was basically a conference to like bring open source enthusiasts together and open source organizations together as well to preach the gospel of open source, you know, to l let people know more about open source. So the conference did well in achieving that because like I said earlier, this was like, that was the first place I learned about what open source was all about. But right after the doors of the conference, I felt overwhelmed because I, I just couldn't like put it into practice because at that time I had this notion that for you to be able to contribute to open source, you have to like contribute through code base. I did not know that there were other like um, means of contribution to open source. So all my mind, all my thought was just to like contribute to the code base. So, um, Fast forward to August 2020, where I read a, an article on Ashnode. Um, the article was basically for beginners, and the author did well in like breaking down concepts of open source and also going ahead to like list and mention open source organizations you can contribute to without even contributing to the code base, and and um, contribute. You can contribute as a technical writer through technical documentation. I was really excited because I felt, oh wow. So, and at that time, a month to that time I read the article, I just started writing. Like that was when I started picking up um, technical writing. So I felt it was an opportunity for me to like, you know, um, finally contribute to open source for this time through technical documentation. I reached out to the author on Twitter via DM, and then the author being nice and friendly, scheduled a one-on-one -on -one, um, call with me to practically, and uh, she practically handheld me, you know. I That was where I made my first quality open source contribution. She practically handheld me and did the do as I do approach. And that I must say really helped me in growing my interest more in wanting to contribute to open source, especially through technical documentation. So yes, that's a quick backstory about my open source journey. And now we go to the interning with async API, how it started. Hmm. It started through um, uh, my um, through a tweet, yeah, while I was scrolling through the tweet at that time. Um, my awesome mentor, Alejandra, she posted on Twitter that she was looking for about six mentors who would love to contribute to async API documentation under the Google Citizen of Docs program. So 
I was super interested because um, I've always wanted to like contribute to open source projects more through technical technical documentation and get into the Google season of docs program. So upon making my research about async KPI, I, I loved what async KPI was all about and what it stood for and the concept of event driven architecture and all of that. So I felt it was it was a great opportunity for me to learn something entirely new from what I've been used to, which is front end development, you know, moving from um, I'm not really moving, like not really moving entirely from what you're doing, but you know, learning something new and learning a new concept that is applicable in the world of technology. Like, yeah, so I saw it as a great opportunity, um, learning about event driven architecture and wanting to improve the documentation of the organization. So I did put in my application forward and then, yeah, um, the application process was all about applicants each applicant, you know, scheduling a one-on-one, um, one -on -one, I think, yeah, it was a Zoom call, a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with my awesome mentor, Alejandra, uh, with Alejandra, and then um, at your own flexible time, but she really made the process very, very flexible for everyone. So um, after the application, I, 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 I really did not want to put my mind to, oh, if I would be selected or not, because most times, if I really want something and I I don't I and I'm not seeing myself either getting it or not getting it, like I just don't want to put my mind to it so I don't end up being sad or you know like oh I didn't get it. So but during the selection, like I saw my name, like I was I was super excited and you know being able to like get into a very competitive program. Of, of such nature and also be selected it's it was it was really um it was a great um opportunity for me and which i did not want to take for granted so i was super excited because i saw my name on the slack community that i was among those that were selected saw it on the um, twitter page of the organization and other platforms so it was a very, very exciting and surreal moment for me. And yeah, that's how it started. So um, what onboarding help did I receive as a new docs contributor? So um, the onboarding, the only, like, I will just categorize the onboarding help into three sections, like I have it in my slides here. The onboarding help were awesome. The first one I love to talk about is the one-on-one -on -one Zoom calls we had with um, Alejandra, and not just Alejandra. Um, yeah, I think um, Lucas at some point. Lucas, by the way, is another awesome mentor that works with her as mentees um, during the program. Um, Alejandra actually scheduled a one-on-one -on -one Zoom call with the six of us to actually to onboard us properly into the program and. Um, what to expect and how um, the workflow will go and all of that. So Alejandro basically broke down um, like basic concepts of event-driven architectures in async KPI. Like this helped me, like someone like myself who is just coming from front-end engineering, you know, something entirely different from what EDAs are all about. So. She helped break down those concepts, ex, you know, like explaining things like producers, consumers, publishers, subscribers, and other concepts in EDA. So it was it was a very very interesting one on one Zoom call with Alejandra. She also helped um, explain the tools that would be useful for workflow, like I said, and then collaboration and communication and. Uh, tools that we'll be using to contribute to the technical documentation. Another onboarding help I received from, um, from the community and SNKPI in general as a new docs contributor were articles. Like the mentors literally took their time to share helpful resources that will put you up to speed with learning the concepts on SNKPI and you know, like event driven architecture in general because those articles actually helped me in improving my writing flow and helping in explaining the concepts on um, technical writing tasks that I was assigned that I was assigned as a 
contributor or let me say mentee so yeah those resources those articles were really helpful and that is that is another onboarding help i received um next is the onboarding workshop this workshop was conducted by lucas he did a great job the workshop was split into four parts and i must say even up to this moment the the um workshop helps me in writing um like because he literally did um showed us use cases of where a sync api can be you know can be used explained a lot of concepts explain tools that um the other tools that is built by the community you know like um the async api cli for example and she showed us how async api studio works and a couple of other things and these were the wonderful resources um onboarding help i received as a new docs contributor that has helped me during the program um as a as a docs contributor yeah so how do contributors get answers to their questions contribute as 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 a contributor um as a mentee most times whenever i feel blocked i get answers from for my questions through the community like the community is a very welcoming one and this is the first place i always go to whenever i like i feel blocked about something i'm writing on or i do not understand so for example let's say i'm working on the tools or or a specification concepts for example and i don't understand um for example let me say consumer or what a consumer is or what a broker is I, it's the community is so accessible that you know you can get answer like in in next few hours right because there are people who are always willing to help you like you can just go on to one of the threads and type in your questions and then you get answers to them the the um the community is a really awesome one also quick calls like there are times where i was literally blocked and then um i didn't i did not go to the, I, I did not type my question in the thread at this time i wanted like an immediate help and i reached out to alejandra and she helped me another case there was a case of a technical issue i i had with one of the tools we work with when contributing like when writing our, our documentation so at first it was running and then it was not running but i had to like reach out to lucas oh my god i need to make a pull request and then he helped me you know get unblocked with um what the issue could have been and why my tool was not working properly so yeah this these are ways contributors get answers to their question for me i'm speaking from my perspective um i don't know um about my fellow mentees but i know that the mentors are always willing to help you get unblocked immediately um they there's this um bi-weekly meeting we also do with as we mentees and the ment um, and alejandra she helps us get unblocked on the call like and also like help us to get in sync so everyone can be like in sync with what we're working on um help us to communicate like okay so what 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 were you working on this week what, it's it's just a great way to like help you not feel stuck about anything so yeah what do i love most about contributing to this um to async api um the first one for me is mentorship i love the fact that we have experienced mentors who we could easily run to whenever we face any issue or challenges they are always willing to help like they are always willing to answer your questions oh hey anisa what are you like working on right now do you have any issues do you have any problem oh no it's fine and if it's not fine you can easily tell them oh yes i actually don't know how this is going on like it's it's really awesome because whenever you're going through a journey and you have someone who can handhold you through the journey it literally makes things easy like very easy through that journey there's no feeling of being overwhelmed and like you know having to like figure everything out on your own you, you know for sure that you are definitely not alone so having mentorship is one 
big thing in the world of technology. And this is one thing that Async KPI has been able to bless me and I'm sure my fellow mentees with. And um, yeah, mentorship, that's one for me. Then two, the community. <laughs> Async KPI community is really welcoming. If you're a new contributor or you don't even know um, anything about open source or you've never contributed to open source before, you can come, 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 let, let um, the community show you how it's done. Um, you can literally re reach, reach out to um, the community and then there's definitely someone who would like help you and answer your questions, you know, you know, help you through your first pull request or more pull requests. And other things like the community is really friendly and welcoming. That's one thing I love about the community. And everyone is so passionate about contributing. So yeah, another opportunity, um, another thing I love about contributing to the to Async KPI is because of conference participation. Um, I'm someone who ordinarily like um do not do not take out time to like participate in conferences um i do i just do it once in a while and but because i think api is, is something i love I, I love the organization and i love what it stands for and i love the fact that they gave us all to like you know participate in the conference and it's it's such a beautiful opportunity that i i decided to like take and share my story about what it felt like you know contributing to Async KPI. So here I am participating in an international conference, uh, um, Async KPI organization conference. So yes, um, another thing I love about continuous uh, about contributing to Async KPI is due to the continuous learning. Like there's so many concepts to learn about, and I, I'm super excited about the things I've learned so far and the things I'm still learning. <laughs> it's so it's so fun. Um, as, as a techie, you know, learning new things is um, can be fun. So being able to like learn continuously is what I love about um, contributing to Async KPI. Um, uh, as someone who who is more into coding front end and then now having knowledge about what asynchronous um, APIs are all about, how you can document it, how you can generate your code from them, you know, concepts um, like what providers, um, what uh, producers are, consumers, and you know, other concepts, and it's so interesting. Another thing I love about contributing to Async KPI is the fact that this has given me the opportunity to like give my quota to the community, like, you know, by sharing my knowledge and then, you know, help improve the technical documentation of the organization. That's another beautiful thing I, I definitely did not have in my slide, but I just wanted to mention and share. Like it's so it's so amazing, and I I I'm, I, I love the fact that um, Async KPI has given me the opportunity to be able to like help to improve the documentation alongside my fellow mentees. So yeah, these are the things I love most about contributing to Async KPI. So why can't you join us? Like. Async KPI is a very, very friendly community, both beginner friendly, and even if you're an experienced contributor, you can come join the initiative. Um, yes, the website, you can visit the website to learn more about Async KPI and how you can use it in your event driven architecture pattern. Um, we also have the GitHub um, page. Here you can see a couple of um, tools and technologies that Async KPI has developed to be able to like help you know, that are actually open source that, that can help you, you know, like improve your um, organization team, you know, company best practices, like defining um, company best practices as well through the async API validation and a couple of other things. So we also have the Slack channel. That's my favorite part. Like, come, come, ask your questions. Um, you can follow Async KPI on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Async KPI also has a YouTube channel where they like. For me, it's a resource bank for so many things about Async KPI and even beginner architecture. You can learn, um, learn about it, join the community calls, and yeah, that's it. 
Um, thank you. Thanks for listening to my talk. Um, you send me a DM on, on Twitter at Anissa Akimbani. I'll be willing to accept your questions. Thank you for listening. Bye. All right. So that was uh, the last talk. Um, this time from Anissa Takimbani. Uh, so we don't have Anissa joining us, unfortunately, for questions, but we're in a synchronous conference, right? So leave your questions on the chat or on the conference 2022 channel on Slack, and she will be happy to respond uh, whenever she can, of course. So, um, want to wait a little bit for people who might want to drop some questions or thoughts and uh, then we go with the closing remarks <clears throat> all right um, No one. Okay. I just want to share a thought in the meantime about her presentation. And is you can't imagine <laughs> how happy it makes me to hear these words, right? Like when I see people sharing these experiences they have with the SNKPI community, right? When I first created this project, I never imagined that we were going to create something like this. So, so yeah, this is just a personal um, feeling, right, that I want to share that it really makes me super happy. Uh, and it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a sign of how much we're growing. Like I, I've never, never, ever interacted with Anissa before. <laughs> and that's also a sign of the, of the, of the, of the size, right? Like it's impossible to interact with each other, uh, all of us, right? So it's becoming even more and more difficult. So, so yeah. And, uh, but yeah, like that doesn't mean that I don't look forward to, of course, uh, speaking to her and to all of you, of course, but yeah, it's becoming less and less uh, possible, <laughs> right? So, yeah. Um, well, I'm not going to extend anymore. Um, you probably folks have, uh, are tired. So just a few, um, a few like uh, last words, uh, for the, for the day today, I would love to thank everyone who has been on the, you know, behind the scenes, uh, helping with the organization of the conference and, um, and, you know, like, especially with the day to day, right? So, so with the organization of today. You have seen Lucas on stage, and then you have seen me here. <laughs> well, and also Sergio, Pedro, and, uh, and Ahmad as well. But um, but yeah, the, the reality is that there are many more people behind making it possible, making it easy for us, for instance, that I just look in a, I just look in a place for questions, and uh, they're always there looking on all the channels and uh, collecting all of them for whoever's on the stage, right? So, so yeah, so big thanks to Ace, to Ben, to Deepak, to Karuna, you know, to Barbaño, to Subic, to Huda, um, to Sergio as well. Um, and yeah, and to everyone uh, else uh, involved here. Uh, I hope I'm not um, missing anyone of today, of course. Tomorrow we'll have even more people, different people as well. So, so yeah. And, uh, yeah, and a big thanks to my beloved Lucas. You know uh, how much I love him. So, so yeah, he's really doing a uh, big job and a big effort trying to organize this conference and trying to make it as uh, as perfect as possible, right? And as good as possible. And that is, um, yeah, that is remarkable, right? Um, so yeah, big props uh, and a big round of applause for for Lucas, right? 
So, so yeah. Um, and uh, we have, uh, so this is not the end of the conference. This is the end of uh, today, uh, you know, today uh, session, today's sessions. Uh, we have one more, uh, two more days. We have uh, tomorrow and Saturday as well, uh, full of really great talks. Um, uh, as I said before, I'm not gonna be here. And that is exactly what I wanted to uh, remark here. Like super happy, super proud of this community that we are creating together uh, so much that I actually, I'm actually not necessary here. And that is amazing. That is, that is an amazing feeling. When we started the, the conference two years ago during the pandemic, we were just uh, Eva, my wife, uh, you know, um, Lucas and myself, just three of us. And uh, we did the whole day of, of talks and it was online as well. Uh, we were on a lockdown, so, so yeah, it was all online. And uh, and yeah, we, we organized it on, in two weeks and as, as soon as we could with the resources we had, which were almost none. So yeah, so seeing how much it grew, right? Uh, maybe the format's still the same, but the amount of people who are behind it uh, helping and, and offering help, even those who you cannot see, right? Um, it is it is amazing. It is simply amazing. So yeah, so um, props to all of you, the community, right? Because you are actually making it happen. So thank you, everyone, and see you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Enjoy.